Hello guys and welcome back. In this lecture, we are going to be implementing a spam detector. We have a data set that is full of SMS messages and we would like to filter them to know which messages are considered a spam and which ones are considered harmless. We see these spam detectors everywhere nowadays. We can see them on our mobile phones where we have that small folder that we call it spam. We see it also in our email address. There is also a special folder that is dedicated to spam emails. How do they work? How can your email provider categorize emails and tell exactly if this is a harmless or a spam email? This is the topic of this section right here. And this is the project we are going to implement. And it is going to cover a lot of aspects from NLP, pandas, machine learning. So there is a lot of techniques that we are going to use in this compilation project. So get ready and let's get our hands dirty implementing this project. First off, I want to show you this email list. So there is a guy who actually compiled all of these SMSs and he actually labeled them if they are harmless like he's calling them ham or a spam so we have hams and spams let's take a spam example we have england versus macedonia do not miss gold teams news these are advertisement and in most of the cases advertisement is went to spam at least in the bit older technology now in the newer technology we would see that there is a specific folder dedicated for advertisement and if we have a data set that is labeled with advertisement we can do the same thing and even categorize this list to three categories ham spam and advertisement so right now advertisement are going to be considered as spam now let's take a ham example like hi babe i'm at home wanna do something so these are ham where are you how did you perform this is also a ham so this data set consists of 5574 messages that's a lot and we can do a lot with this data now let me show you what is the process we are going to follow in order to solve this problem so this is my spam detector what i have here is only a table right that consists of label and message okay this is all i have what i want to do is i would like to pass this somehow to naive bias algorithm this is naive bias and i would like to get a label or a prediction or a classification to ham or spam so i want to train this model to do that but with this format it's impossible to do it because here we have a label and some really long text i mean how can naive bias actually classify this i need to convert this into something else what i want to do eventually is to create a model like that which is going to take a vector of words or a list and just predict a label ham slash spam okay this is the final result but what actually i want to do as well i would like to train it so there should be some training here and this is the format for training as well but how can i create a vector word what is a vector of words well the first step is to combine all the words together so I'm going to be collecting all the unique words from all the messages and create a very, very large vector that could consist of, I don't know, 8,000 words maybe. Then what I would like to do next is to actually apply some NLP because I want to reduce the words that are not necessary. And I would like to convert the words into their stems so i would like to apply everything that i have learned in natural language processing so that the training process is easier number three i would like to create a frequency for every word i have and we remove this okay i need the frequency meaning let's say i have the word 
win and it is repeated five times in one message i would like to know how many times a certain word is repeated now what else would I like to do i would like to create the vector now which is all the words let's say win lose let lottery all the words and then i would like to have a frequency here two times and this is for every message so let's say this is message one this is message two let's say win here was repeated two times lose is zero let is zero lottery is zero times in message two win is zero lose is zero let is zero maybe lottery is repeated one time and we will continue like that for all the messages okay so the pre-processing is actually going to be longer on a little bit harder than the modeling itself and this is the reality you spend way more time on pre-processing your data preparing it so that it is suitable for your prediction model and after we are done with all of this we will be able to predict single entries so right now we train the model on all the messages all of them okay and we created a model for that and now what i would like to do with this model is to actually give it from here a single message out of this list or data set that i have and this single message then will be predicted as a spam or ham okay because this is my final goal my final goal is to prepare a model so that it is generalizing what is a spam and what is a ham so that i can pass it individual messages that i would get in the future and to be able to predict it now let's get our hands dirty and let's start implementing this project i am really excited to start this section with you guys because it will be including a lot of techniques that we have learned and we are going to be applying them in one project first here i have imported some libraries we already know nltk pandas numpy tokenize uh, stop words from corpus and of course we have the wordnet limitizer so let me compile this and get ready to start importing my data i'm gonna say here data is equal to pandas.read underscore csv and i'm just gonna pass the path of my data set here which is included in the attachment and you can download it and follow along now there is one thing in this data that it is separated by spaces so you need to specify that the separation is equal to t which is for spaces some data like a regular csv file but here since this is a text file we need to separate it by spaces even though we are using csv to read it that's totally fine as long as you are separating it correctly then you have no issues and what i mean by separation is the separation between every message finally we would like to create columns for the data we have so we're going to say here names is equal to label and we have message now simply we could say data dot head and just to see what we have here as you can see we have all of our messages with label and message column okay nothing fancy so far what i would like to do right now is to define a small function that is going to pre-process the messages remember i would like to apply stuff like stop words limitizing i need to apply all of that so let's do it i'm gonna say here define pre-process and i'm gonna pass it some data first i would like to convert all of my data into a lower case i would say data equal data dot lower so that i don't have a problem between capitalized words and non-capitalized words there would be treated equally now i'm gonna say here lem is equal to word net limitizer and this is the object for it now we can tokenize our data so i'm going to say here words is equal to word underscore tokenize and then i'm going to be tokenizing the data okay what's next i would like to apply some stop words so i'm going to say here words is equal to i'm going to use list comprehension again so here we have word for word in words if word not in stop words 
dot words and then just pass English. Okay. We have seen this syntax before when we were talking about stop words and also when we created that small project regarding frequency on Wikipedia pages. Okay, so what's next? Of course, it's limitization. We have words is equal to... Now, bear with me here because we are going to use list comprehension this time for limitization and I won't be applying that function that chooses adverbs, nouns, and whatever. I would like to only apply it for verbs. And that's fine for such a small data set because what I'm concerned here about is only verbs being converted to their base form. Okay? So if I see that the performance is not that good, I could apply a limitizer that passes for adjectives, for nouns. But for now, I would like only to limitize verbs, okay? So I'm going to say here, lem.limitize. And I'm going to be passing word. And position is v, all right? This is for the tagging. So we are only concerned about verbs. Now we are going to see for word. So it's like, this is, it's like saying word for word. You know, like x for x, it's just list comprehension. But instead, we are limitizing, and whatever the result is, is going to be for word. Okay? So this is just a regular list comprehension. Then we say in words. Okay? So it's like word for word in words. We are exploding them or expanding them. And finally, I would like to convert all of those to string again, because I'm not really done pre-processing but this is only the first step so i'm going to say here words is equal to how do we convert a, from a list to a string we just open a quotation mark like that and then call the method join and just we pass the list okay by that we can convert any list into a string okay and finally we would like to just return words uh, we have some invalid syntax let's see where did we go wrong here all right, here we did not actually say not, we said no. Okay, and now we're good. This is our function. And welcome back. What we would like to do at this moment is to actually test this preprocess function. We can simply do that by calling a test, by creating a test variable. And let's read this first message. I'm going to say data. From the column message, I would like to take the first message, I would like to print it before processing, and then I would like to process it by calling pre process and pass this test to it, and then print it after it is being processed. Okay, so now pre process is compiled, and the next one. Let's take a look. We have decapitalized all the words, that's good. We have removed the stop words, that's good. But since this is really just slangs and messages full of typos because people are writing without autocorrect maybe, stem limitization did not do very well. And that's okay. For this stage, we are doing still pretty good. But still here we have some full stops and points and commas that I really don't want. How about we we use a regular expression or the regular expression tokenizer in order to get rid of that. We can say here from nltk dot tokenize import reg exp tokenizer and let's apply it there. So it's very simple. Remember, regular expression takes only strings. So we will do it after we convert here back to string. We can do it at this stage as well. So it's not really an issue. So we have tokenizer is equal to regular expression tokenizer and then the regular expression is r open a parentheses we need a back slash w and plus okay next we will say words is equal to tokenizer dot tokenize and then pass words and then i would like to convert it back to string so let's do this we will copy the first the same statement and we should be good to go. Let's compile this and this. As you can see now, we got rid of all the points around and as well for commas, if we have any, let's take a different message maybe. We got rid of exclamation marks as well, question marks. Well, that's totally okay. Now, 
what we would like to do is to create the table that we will be passing. As we talked about, well, messages cannot be passed as they are and they need to be pre-processed. I will create a dictionary now, process messages, and this dictionary is going to contain a key for label, the value is list, then we have for messages, also a list, and then we need the frequency of every word in the messages. Okay, so right now we are ready to pre-process those messages with the function we have created. I'm going to say here for i in range from 0 to len of data messages. Since I have a lot of messages, I would like to process only a small part of them, at least while I am developing because I want the functionality to work rather than the actual training, because we might do mistakes. And since this takes a long time in the pre-processing, I would like to only take maybe the first 300 or 400 messages. This is why I would like to do here minus 5,000, meaning I, don't, I want the total number of messages minus 5,000. This will leave us with around 400, okay? Now, I am iterating over all the messages I have in my data. Now, this is what I would like to do. I would like to append to this message all the pre-processed messages okay so i'm gonna say process underscore messages dot append what i would like to append is the message being processed so i'm gonna call a pre-process and i'm gonna be passing the messages right so i'm gonna say data message index i and after i'm done i would like to convert it to a list so after i pre-process it i'm gonna convert it here to a list let's close the data parentheses here and we're good. What do I want to do next? I would like to also append the label. So I'm going to say here, pros messages. We already have the label stored in here, right? In the data label. So I'm going to say here, label dot append data label and the index, of course, from I. And finally, I would like to just print this. So pros messages. Okay, we got an error. Dictionary does not have a method append. Okay, here we forgot to just pass the messages. Okay, and we're good. Let's run it. As you can see right now, we have a dictionary of label containing all the labels and then the messages. Okay, this is what we are looking for at the moment. What I would like to do right now is to create a few more functions. So far we created one function here and we have processed all the messages and separate them into label and messages, but we still need to get the frequency. Let us add one more function to this function area here. I'm going to call this function store all word. Okay, this function is going to take all the words in all of my messages and just to create a giant list of every single word. Okay, so I'm going to create here a simple all words list. It's empty initially. And of course, here I'm going to be passing a list and this list will contain all of my messages. I'm going to say here for item in li. So iterate over every message and just append that word. I'm going to say here all words dot append item. Let's call it word so it is more explanatory. And here let's just uh, append a word. And then I'm just going to return all words. All right. Now I'm going to create another function that will get me the most common words and then append them to a data frame. Okay. So I'm going to say here diff get most common words i'm gonna pass it a list and an index because i'm gonna be passing the messages one by one here and an index we'll see what we will do with that in a minute first i would like to define a global for df because i want to modify it then we are going to call a frequency and an ltk dot frick dist and for every list of words I send it, I would like to get the frequency, okay? 
and store it in the frequency variable. Now I would like to say frick is equal to frequency dot most underscore common and the len of frequency. Now you might ask why would I do that? It's really annoying actually to extract the words from frequency distributor. The easiest way is by using most common and it returns most common 5, 10, 20 or whatever words we have. But if I want all the words to be returned, this is the easiest way. I say most common and I simply pass all the words, right? Whatever the length of these words is, I'm going to pass it. So if, if I have 2000 words, I'm saying return the most common 2000 words. Because as I said, this object, it, it's really annoying to get the uh, all the words from it. And this is the easiest way. Okay, here's what's next. I'm going to say for f in frequency meaning for every word in frequency i would like to do the following df f0 then index is equal to f1 now bear with me i have columns that are equal to the number of words in all of my messages now i would like to iterate on every message and check how many times is that has that word occurred let me show you again i have a data frame that contains all the words. Remember, I had win, lose, lottery, etc. Okay? And I have message one, message two. This is what I'm doing. I'm taking every message and I am checking every word and then saying, okay, the frequency distributor returned that this word has three elements. So I'm searching in my data frame. I found the word and just writing three here. Okay, same thing for the next word. I am iterating over my message, decomposing it into words, getting this word, searching for it in my data frame, and then saying how many times it repeated using the frequency distributor. Let's say one and then two. Then we get the next message. Two, three, one, whatever. Okay, this is how we are filling our table. We are searching for that word and putting a value as how many times it was repeated, which is the frequency. So this is exactly what we are doing here. Now we are going to test all of this. Let's see the results of our functions. Now, what I'm going to be testing is this store all words function initially. I'm going to say here all words is equal to store all words. Then I'm going to pass the whole column. So I'm going to say here pros underscore messages and then all the column message. Now let's print all words. And also I would like to print the len of all words. But I'll do that in a minute. Um, yeah, we need to recompile this and let's jump back here. As you can see now, we have a list of all the words. Now let's see what is the length of this all words. So I'm going to say len all words. It is 572. Now let us print all words. Okay, this is not good. We having a list inside multiple lists. What we want to do is to create one whole list that contains everything. It means our function is not working. And that's why. We have only one for loop. We would like to iterate over every message in the column of messages. Okay, so let me fix this really quickly. I'm going to say here first for message in li and then I would like to say for word in message. Okay, so first we are taking one message. We are then taking all the words in it appending them to this list then taking the second message doing the, th the same thing and we should end up with one list containing all the words so let's see if this fix will work and we're good now we have one list containing everything that we need that's really good let's see what is the length of this all words we have 5810 words and of course, we might have some repetitions. So how can I solve this repetition? Well, I'm going to say here, all words is equal to set all words. Do you remember the set? The set is going to convert the list here to a set, meaning no two elements should be the same. 
So now let's see what is the length of this all words afterward. Now we have only 2065. That's really good. And by that we have tested the first function. Now let's create a data frame from what we've done so far. And then I would like to test the second function, which is getting the frequency or getting the most common words. Let's say df is equal to paint the data frame dot data frame and the columns what are my columns for the data frame? We just saw that. The columns, those are all my words. Okay, where are all my words? They are stored in all words. So columns is equal to all words, right? Now, if I print this DF really quickly, you'll see that I have a huge table consisting of 2065 columns, but we still have no entries. It makes sense so far. Now, let's create some entries. But before that, I want to insert the label as well here, just because I want to really see them together, okay? Because later we're going to drop this, but just initially because I want to see what's going on. Because I want to see everything combined together. I'm going to say here, df.insert. Where do I want to insert it? I want to insert it here at the beginning. So I want to insert it at index 0. And then what is the label of that column? It's literally label. And then we have here, pros messages label, right? I would like to take all the labels that I have, everything, all these labels. And I would like to just put them in my df okay now let's see what do we have in this df great i have a huge table right now and it's full of nans but at least i have my labels here correct okay so here it is 572 by this okay what's next i would like to test my other function so i'm gonna be iterating again over everything let's say four I in range from zero to the length of my pros messages and then here messages. I would like to iterate over all of my messages. Let's first fix this for because it's not or it's for. Now we are going to loop over frequencies. I'm going to say frick is equal to get frick of words. Now we are going to say set pros messages then we have message and here we have i so we are iterating over every message creating a set of it and then we will say here get most common words now we are testing our function we are passing frequency and i what i am intending to have now is to return the word and if it exists in the table or not okay so let me show you one more time i want to create a table this is my data frame this is remember this is win this is lose uh, this is lottery and here is my message number one and we're going to say is there a win word here either i would say yes or no and i used the frequency analyzer to do that here say no no yes say message two here yes there is win there is no lose there is no lottery etc i'm creating a binary table like that we could either create frequencies or we could create a binary table just like this. Now, if we execute this, our get most common word is not defined. Let me recompile this. Copy the name here. And just maybe we had a typo. Yeah, we said ger instead of get. Let's run this and we're good. We have executed our function without any errors. But what is our function is giving us exactly? Well, if we are to just put a small print statement here to print the frequency and then run the program again, we will see that we got every word, we got lists of multiple lists for every message we have a list actually, and we got every word that is repeated. Okay, now all we need to do is take those now and and what it did is it did merge this with our DF, meaning that it was searching for Go in our data frame. If it found it, it will put one as a frequency. Search for the next one, the next one, the next one, and just filling up the table. Now let's remove that print. 
and let's clean our table right now our table is still unreadable because if i just say df you'll see that i still have tons of nans which i need to drop actually there is a lot of words here that are not nans which we would see once in them okay so if i try to print here uh df let's say go zero i would get one right because as we saw earlier go was in the first message actually if we try to print it if you want now if i say data message zero you'll see that we have go and in our df right now we had go as well take a look go right now has a value of one meaning it was occurring so don't be fooled that this is all nans because we have around 2000 it's normal that we don't see the ones that we have added now what I want to do is to clean this table a little bit. So I'm going to say here df is equal to df dot fill na with zero. It means that if we did not update it with one, it should be zero. Meaning that let's say in the first message, this word never occurred. So they should be zero. And let's print df right now. And we have a clean table. Okay, so everything we have done so far was actually just data processing and as you see data processing does take a lot of time in order to bring it to a form that is acceptable by the model we are trying to predict with now let's try and write our model i'm going to be importing two libraries here one of them is the sklearn model selection for the splitting of training and testing data and we have the gaussian naive bias we have talked about both of these intensively and now we are going to use them in order to predict i'm going to create a variable here called x spam meaning those are my features namely all of those those are my features and the only thing i don't want is this label so we are going to drop it let's drop it we will say df drop and then we will pass the name label and the axis which is one so this is axis one and by that we have created our x spam now y spam is going to be df and it will be specifically only the label right this is what i want to predict this is my y and these are my features now it's time to split them so we're going to say x train x test y train and y test is going to equal to train underscore test underscore split and we will pass it x spam and y spam okay now let's create the model we will say model is equal to gaussian naive bias now let's fit it we'll say model dot fit we have x train and we have y train and then we will be doing some prediction we're going to say y predict is equal to model dot predict what would we like to predict of course the x test and then i want to import one more thing here which is the accuracy score so we have from sklearn dot metrics import accuracy underscore score okay so we created our features our labels we have split those into testing and training and finally we created a model we we trained it and now we are trying to predict with it let's see what will be my accuracy how can we do that well we are going to say accuracy underscore score we need to compare y test with y predict right so let me recap this line a little bit we are predicting a portion of those right because we have split them and then we are getting the actual results so we are like passing those data to the prediction model and we already have the ground the truth and we are comparing them and by comparing them we can get what is the accuracy of our model so let's execute this uh yeah white test here this is a capital letter and here we go we got 0 0.88 what i want to do now is actually create the small function that is going to predict single data so far we are getting our table splitting it and 
only predicting on a portion of the table. What I want to do is having new entries and be able to predict them. Let's do that. Now let's write a small code that is going to pre-process any sentence or a message, then it will determine if it is a spam or not. Now there is the thing, you cannot really give your model a text and just expect it to predict it. You need to convert your text to the same format we are using, otherwise it won't be able to predict and you will have some errors. Let's see how we can replicate the same steps that we had for only one sentence or one message. Let's say that we have a test text and well, let, a, let it equal to I owe this one million to you. It could be anything actually, just be it any sentence we want. Now let's say that we have test text dot. What I would like to do now is to pass this text into my pre-processing function. We already have a pre-processing function that we can use. So I'm going to do that. I'm going to say pre-process my test text. Okay, and we did this. Now, if I just print it, you'll see that I got rid of most of the words and we got only oh, 01 million. Okay, now I want to replicate what we have here. I would like to have the features, right? Because what we predict, what we provide to our model, if we take a look here, is actually an X test. And an X test was created from here, from X spam. And X spam is nothing but my features. So I need to replicate this table here with one row for one entry. I don't want the label because this is Y test. I only need X test. So how can we do that? We can do that very quickly using some dictionary. We will say L, for example, and let's open up uh, curly brackets. Now, what I would like to do is I want to iterate over all of my keys right here. Okay, those are the keys that we need. So how can we iterate over them? We can say for k for key in, let's say in the f dot keys. So we are getting all the uh, data frame keys we have here. We are iterating over them and we are saying if k in test text. And now we are saying if this word exist in that in here anywhere let's say uh the word o let's say it exists here if it finds it i would like to have to put one here okay that means we are iterating over all of those one by one then checking those three words if i can if i can find them here and just put one if i find it anywhere okay now if this works what i would like to do is just say l k is equal to one what does this mean this is how we add a key value pair to my dictionary right if you want to add a new dictionary element you you need a key and a value and here you are saying hey this is my new key and this is my new value add a new entry to my dictionary then we have else l k equals zero meaning if i did not find this word let's say i am comparing this word with here, is it the same? No, then put a zero. If it is the same, yes, then put a one, okay? And that's it. Now we are ready to create a new data frame. I'm gonna call this dfx is equal to pd dot data frame, and we will pass L, and we need to specify the index, which is index zero, and we're good. Now, if I print dfx, sorry, here we need index equals zero, and that's it. Take a look here. We have only one entry. We have all the keys and we have all the values here. We can take a look at what was the L looking like before converting it to a data frame. It looked like this. We were adding entries, key and a value using this statement, key and a value. And that's it. Now we need to do one more thing because if I print DFX, I still have a label. I don't want the label. I'm going to say DFX is equal to DFX again dot drop label and then we have axis equals one okay and we're good now all i need to do is to predict i want to predict if this is a spam or not how do we do that 
Well, we are ready. We would just say model dot. This is the same model you have trained here. Predict. What do I want to predict? The DFX. And as you can see, it labeled it as it's not a spam. Let's say here, congratulations, you won a price. You can see now we predicted it as a spam. Now the last step I want to do here is to save and load the model. Okay, I'm going to create that. We're going to import pickle. Pickle is used to save and load sklearn models and to actually store object data in Python. I'm going to give the file name here, which is going to be spamfilter.sav. And then we will call the method dump. So we'll say pickle.dump. We need to pass the model. And we need to say here open file name and wb. If we execute this, we will be saving the model. And let's write the code to load it. So I'm going to say load model is equal to pickle dot load. Then we have open. We have file name, the same file name we have here. And we will be reading instead of writing RB. And finally, we can use this load model right now. So we can say load model dot predict dfx. So if I execute this and this, I would get the same result. Okay. So here we have saved our model into the same folder as our code. And then we have loaded it into a different variable name and we try to predict. This is how we save our model. All right, so the topic we are going to talk about now is called ANN or Artificial Neural Networks. This is actually started as a machine learning algorithm in order to solve problems like regression and classification so what we can do now is try to represent what does an ann look like we would have some input nodes we would have some hidden nodes here which we call hidden layer and then we have an output node okay the inputs here are connected to all of the hidden nodes so every single input node will be connected like this. So this is connected, this is connected like that, this is connected like this, this one as well. Same thing would go for the final node. One, two, three. Everything is connected together. Now finally, we would have the hidden layer or the hidden nodes connected to the output node. Now, this might seem complicated, but it's really not. What are those nodes anyway? Well, those nodes can hold numbers, okay? Let's say that we are trying to predict the price of a house, and we have the following features. We have the size of the house, maybe a meter square, and we also have the number of rooms. And we have the location itself. Let's say that these three parameters can determine my output, which is price. How can we map this problem to the neural network? Well, all we can do is see this price right here. This is my output. This is what I'm trying to predict, and it will be yellow. Now, the size right here is going to be fed to this node. Okay, and the number of rooms, let's say, let's make it blue, is going to be fed to this node. So a node is just a variable that is holding a number. We can imagine it like that. And we have the location as well. And we are going to color thread, and this is where the location will go. 
And here we will be having a data set that consists of multiple entries. Maybe we have 500 entries. So here we have the number of entries. We have entry 1, 2, 3, all the way to 500. And they are filling all of these information. So here we have a table. What we would do is we would pass this information to this neural network. And here it's going to generate in this area here the price as the output. Okay, so how can we exactly do that? By the way, this data contains also the price. So the data consists of four columns. So it is four columns and it has 500 rows. So this is an array of four times 500. Okay, and it will be passed here and we will do the prediction. This is how it works in regression problems because here we are trying to predict a certain number not a certain category right this is what why we call it a regression classifier using artificial neural networks okay so right now i want to also talk about the intuition behind how can we pass images to such a neural network i'm gonna just erase everything let's assume that i have an image that is of the size four pixels by four pixels Okay, so we have one, two, this is four columns, one, two, three, four. This is a four by four image. And it could contain pictures like maybe for a circle, for a triangle, it could be containing images of anything. And let us say that we would like to classify what is the image we are seeing. Is it a circle? Is it a triangle or maybe is it a square? We want to be able to know that. As you can see here, this is a classification problem. And in our case, we have three categories, meaning that we need three outputs. This is another output and this is one more output. So, of course, we need to do the interconnections to those as well. Like that. like that well things here can get messy as you can see and the neural network interconnections are going to grow in a really large rate but this is how it works now this is for maybe a square this is for a triangle and this is for my circle okay how can we pass these pixels let's say that i have 100 images of circles all of them that look like this i have 100 images for squares and 100 images for triangles okay and all of them are the same size the question is how can we pass this image to this neural network so that we can predict a certain class or a category we need inputs that are equaling to the number of pixels we have here because we are going to take this image and pass it pixel by pixel to this neural network. This means I need 16 inputs, right? Because how many pixels do I have in a 4x4 image? We have 16 pixels. So I'm going to extend this all the way until I have, let's say this is neural, neural 1, neural 2. This is neural number 16. And I'm going to do all the interconnections as well. And we are going to pass this image pixel by pixel like that. And it is the job of this neural network to predict the class. Now, let us dig into some details regarding this network. What is the smallest element here? It is the neuron. Let us draw a neuron. The neuron has inputs, as we can see, let's take this neuron for example, it has multiple inputs coming from multiple places. It has an output going to every next layer. So let's say this is the output layer. This is the hidden layer. And this is the input layer. Okay, so assuming this is a hidden layer, here we have all the inputs layer 
input one, two, three, maybe. And then we have an output. And we also have something called bias. Now, every input here is going to give out to this node a number, right? So this is number one, number two, and number three. I don't know, it could be 14, maybe, could be two, maybe here zero, doesn't really matter. Then here we have something called weight. And these weights are initialized most of the time randomly at the beginning of the program. So this weight could be maybe two, this could be four, this could be zero, this could be three, could be anything. Okay. Now what's going to happen is this neuron is going to calculate all the inputs and produce an output. Okay. We can simply write this as output is equal to maybe number one times weight one plus number two times weight two plus number three times weight three. Okay. I'm not going to be digging into the math of this, but I just want to give you an overview. The calculation here is going to happen and then we will get an output. Now, every single one of those will be also having something called a bias. So this is plus a bias, this is plus a bias, this is a plus a bias. Okay? And then we will get output is equal to a certain number. Maybe 42. Doesn't really matter. Now here we have two choices. We have something that is called activation function at the output of every neuron. This activation function is going to determine if we should fire here and produce this output number or should we turn it off by giving a zero. So here we have two options. One, output equals 42, as the calculation says. Option two, output is equal to zero. This activation function is going to determine that. We will be defining the criteria for this activation function. There are multi-types of those. And maybe the most famous ones are the ReLU, Leaky ReLU, and also we have Sigmoid, we have Linear. There are too many activation functions that we can choose from. And then an output will be produced. This is how a neuron works. But still, this did not give us the answer on how can we actually predict something. Before we continue to understand the whole big picture, we still need to fill in some small pieces. One of them is the activation function. What are the activation functions? I'm going to be talking about the most important one here, which is called ReLU, which looks like that. It is zero in the negative area of the plot, and it is linear positive like that and it, and then we have a linearity like that okay this is called relu this is minus x this is plus x this is plus y and this is here minus y okay and this is the relu now when we have a neural like that and we have an output, and here we have calculated. Remember, we have a calculations from the input. Let's say the calculation has yielded minus five. For any reason, we got that minus five. This minus five is going to be mapped into this activation function here. Now, as you can see, minus five right here is in the negative axis. It means that any number in the negative axis need to be mapped into this plot right here so minus 5 will be 0 right this neuron then will produce 0 to me and by that we can choose to deactivate a neuron if it's a 0 or we can activate it why would we want to do that anyway the reason is when we are predicting some of these neurons will be turned off some of them will be turned on then this will help this neural network to learn certain parameters which we will talk about also in a minute. 
Now, another function that I want to talk about is the softmax. Now, just remember, before digging into the softmax, relu, the relu function is good for regression when it is at the output. When you have a neural network and the output has a relu activation function, this will be helping in solving regression problems. Now, when we talk about softmax, which we will use for classification, softmax looks something like that. Okay, this is not really passing from zero. Much better. This is limited to the range of minus one to one. And here as well, we have until plus one, and here we have minus one. This is very good when predicting probabilities because we want the probability to be in the range of 0 to 1, and this is exactly the function to do that. So this is what softmax does. If we pass this minus 5 to softmax, it's going to map it to a value between minus 1 to 1, which will help us predict probabilities. So this is good for classification. I know, we still didn't get the big picture of the neural network. But we still need to explain a few more pieces. Okay, so the last thing I want to talk about is what we call backpropagation. Backpropagation is the algorithm that is used in order to calculate in order to calculate the error. Now, what is the error? Let me simplify this. Let's say that this is my input node. I have only two hidden nodes and one output node, just to try to simplify this. Okay? Now, let's say here I'm trying to predict something, and this is my output. This is my hidden layer. And this is my input. Okay? Remember, we have Ws here, weights right and we have some biases for each one of them and of course we are feeding numbers from here okay now let us say we are trying to predict the price of a house in a simplified way let's say that it's only dependent on location and here is the price okay so let's say this is in the north it is maybe 2000k another sample from the north maybe 205k south uh, maybe 300k uh, west maybe 400k etc okay now let us label those locations as numbers so or we call this encoding so right now north is zero south is one and west is two okay so whenever we say north it's zero south one west two now let us pass the first sample Okay, this is my first sample. So I'm going to be passing a zero here, and I am expecting to produce a price. Now, I know for this particular entry, remember that I have a table where the price is known. What I want to do later is just, I will give a random location, and it will produce a price for me. But now I have the answer as well, because in order to train a neural network, you need the features, which are those, and the target output, which is the price. Okay, right now I have both of them so that I can train it. Because this is a supervised learning algorithm, meaning I need to have the labels or the answers to my features in order to be able to predict. Okay, now I have zero here and I am expecting to produce 200k. Okay, or 200,000. Now, this zero will be multiplied by these Ws, it will be added to those biases in every node, and then I should be producing 200k. Okay, so the zero will be propagating all the way here, here, and then here. And then let's say we got at the output something like 150k. As you can see, there is a difference. And this difference is what we're going to call the error, which is, let's say, 500k. Now, 
the backpropagation is a really smart algorithm. It is going to go back. What we were doing so far is called forward propagation. Now we want to do a backward propagation, okay? By going this way and calculating the error, we will be going this way as well. We will be updating the W according to some algorithms. We will reach here. We will continue back propagating and updating these Ws according to the error that we have received. Our goal is to minimize this error as much as possible. Then we will come back here. Okay. Now this is the first iteration. Now, if I pass this north one more time with 200k, if I pass it one more time into this algorithm, maybe this time I will get 190k. And now the error is going to equal to only 10k. Okay. And then we will go back. We will keep iterating this data set we have here, all these data, we will keep sending them forward and calculating the error backward until we adjust those weights so that we have the minimum error we can get. The goal of this backpropagation is to minimize error. Okay? This is all what we want to do. And as you can see here, we can calculate the accuracy of this. So let's say we got 150k divided by 200k, we would get an accuracy of 75% maybe. So this is how backpropagation works. All right, so we have covered all the pieces that makes this neural network move and learn. What have we learned so far? A neural network is a supervised learning mechanism. An artificial neural network, ANN, is a supervised machine learning algorithm because we need to provide the answers or the labels when we pass the data. And the data passes it through all of those nodes, which we call the input nodes. They pass through the hidden layers. There is calculations that's going on here. Then we get the predictions, then we get the results of these calculations at the output of the neural network. This is called the training phase, where we pass all of our data through those stages to try to adjust those weights around the nodes in order for us to get the right answer. Now, then comes the backpropagation, where we try to calculate these weights according to the errors we will be getting, and then these weights will be adjusted. This will be repeated for many, many times. We call them epochs. Now, these epochs will continue running through all the data. When we are done, we will be having certain weights around here. Now, when we bring a new data, it will be multiplied by all of these weights just to get one of those, let's say, three prediction. Okay? Now, there is one more thing. This is a shallow network because we have only one hidden layer. Now, since we are going to talk about deep learning, we will be using multiple hidden layers. So if we take a look now, we will be having multiple inputs, many input layers. Then we will be having multiple hidden layers. So this is hidden layer one. This is hidden layer 2, this is hidden layer 3, and then we would be having some outputs. And of course, we have all the interconnection that we have talked about the same way. So here, interconnections everywhere between all the nodes, like that, and like that. This is, those are here, the hidden layer. And hidden layer helps us capture more features so that if our data is complicated, it will, these hidden layers will help us locate nonlinearity as well between features. So let's say we have a complex picture. We will be able to identify what's in it, no matter how complex that picture we are seeing is. This is why deep neural networks is the essence of the new artificial intelligence era. Because before that, before getting into deep neural networks, we used to use AI algorithms and we used to tune them. We used to extract features manually. We used to do 
tons of tweaks so that we can get the model to predict a certain area. But right now, with deep neural networks, we are able to discover hidden patterns in the data that we cannot actually see. And it will actually give us these patterns without telling it to extract them, right? So deep networks really helps us discover new pattern and nonlinearities in our data. And now we are ready to start coding some neural networks. Let's get started. All right, what I'm gonna do right now is program a very simple regression problem, which is predicting a linear function, okay? Let's see how we can do that. First, I'm gonna be importing my NumPy library, and then I will be creating some artificial data. I will be using the random function from NumPy. I'm gonna say x is equal to numpy.random.random then I'm going to pass how many data points do I want to create, let's say 25,000 and it will be one dimension I'm going to scale these points and shift them a little bit okay, so right now if I just simply print this x to show you guys what is this they are just some data, let us maybe print the first 50 numbers as you can see we are creating random points on the x-axis. Now let's calculate the y-axis of this. Let's say that for every x point, I would like to create a y point that is a multiple of 40 of this x point. It means just simply x times 40. Okay? Now let us visualize what we are actually creating. Let me import a new library, and it's the matplotlib. So I'm going to say from mat plot lib import by plot as plt okay so we are importing matplotlib next i'm gonna say plt dot plot what do i want to plot the x and the y okay let's just give them some labels so i'm gonna say plt x label is going to be x point Okay, and then I will be creating the same thing for y, and this will be my y points. Now let's plot this. I'm going to say plot.show, and let's run it. We need to run this one first, then this one. Okay, what we got is just a very simple linear function. We are giving some x points, and we have y points. Now, I want to train my neural network. So that whenever I give any point, let's say I give x equal 5, I would like it to go and just give me 25 as a prediction, right? I wanted to predict this, what does this y function do? So you give it some x points and it should predict the y without knowing what is the formula of y. This is my goal prediction. Now, for training, this model, I would be passing it x and y. Now, let's go step by step on how to do that. Now, let us import some packages from the Keras library. So we'll say from Keras.models import sequential. Sequential is a capital letter here. Then we have another thing from Keras layers. I want to import something called dense. Okay? Now, sequential is like a container that you can put neurons in it. You can think about it like that. And dense, you can think about it as some neural networks. It could be the input layer, it could be a part of the hidden layer, it could be the output layer. So, it is a set of neural networks, like the one we've seen when we were explaining what is a neural network in the previous section. I would like to also import some callbacks from callbacks import history. Now, History is something that we will use in order to plot what is the performance for our training and test data. 
We will see that also later. Let us start building the model. The first step is to create this sequential container we are talking about. So I will say model is equal to sequential, just like that. Okay, the container is ready. Now let's start adding some neurons to this. We will say model dot add and open a parenthesis, call the dense function, open a new parenthesis. Now, how many neurons do I want here? Well, I want 200 neurons. Next question, how many inputs do I have? I have only one input, right? How many features am I predicting? Only the x-axis. So I only have one neuron that will take these x points one by one, right? So I'm going to say input underscore dimension is equal to one. Next, what is my activation function? We have talked about activation functions and we are going to be using ReLU. Okay. This is a regression problem, but it doesn't matter if it's regression or classification. All the input layers and the hidden layers can be ReLU, no problem, regardless of the problem we are trying to solve. Okay. It's only the matter of what we, we use on the output layer that makes a difference if we are using regression or classification. Okay. Now let us copy this. And let's create a deep neural network. Let's create another layer with 50 neurons. And this is not an input layer, so we don't need to pass any input. This is my input layer, right? It is already defined in the first dense. Let's create one more dense layer with 10 neurons. And then since this is regression, I would like to use dense like that okay i only need one neuron because i am doing regression here now if we remember now we have the first layer now we have the input then first layer with 250 and 10. so if we take a look here it's like having one input here and then having 200 layers here 100 layers here 50 layers here 10 layers here and then one output See, we are replicating this neural network. All right, this is how we create our model. The next step will be to compile it and start the training. Before starting to code any artificial neural networks, we need to install a couple of libraries. And the first one is called TensorFlow. So we need to say pip install TensorFlow, okay? Run that, let it install, and then we need to install Keras. So you need to say pip install Keras. Once you have these two libraries, you are ready to start coding. Those two libraries are the most famous libraries when it comes to neural networks. Especially TensorFlow, it helps you build deep neural networks from scratch, actually, and tweak all the details inside it. And Keras is actually a wrapper around TensorFlow, which helps you deal with TensorFlow on a higher level. So this makes deep learning and programming uh, deep learning models way easier. We are going to be focusing on Keras because it traps TensorFlow and it makes our work way easier. So let's get started. There is one more step that we would like to add before we started training this model. Do you remember the backpropagation algorithm that we have talked about? Well, right now it's time to configure it. This is the step that we call compile. So I'm going to say model.compile. Now, we need to specify the name of the algorithm that will be responsible for calculating the error. And this error is something that we call the loss. So we're going to say the loss is equal to mean squared error. This is the name of the formula that will be calculating the loss. Okay. Next. Actually, backpropagation is an optimization problem. And there is a lot of optimizers that try to find what is the 
minimum error that we could get from this formula okay so we need to specify what is the name of the optimizer that we will be using so we'll say optimizer is equal to adam and this is actually the back propagation now it's ready and it is added to my model now we are ready to start training the training which we call fit is going to train this model but this function here returns something called history object and it contains the performance of this training so we need to say here history so that we can store the result of this training and the performance and then we will say model fit and we need to pass what is my features and my output my x here and my y here okay next there is a few parameters that we would like to configure as well we have something called batch size which is how many data points do i want to send for training at a time let's say 50 these parameters are important if we have a very very large data and we would like our cpu or gpu to be able to cope with this amount of data then we have the approaches which is how many times do we want to iterate through this data so we send them once two, twice three times four times remember that we send the data points multiple times so that we can adjust the weights here are our weights we send the same data multiple times in order to learn as much as we can from it how many epochs do i want to run let's say maybe 20. and there is a parameter that is called the verbose which is how the output of this training will look like it's like the command line output we will see while we are training and there are multiple types and we will be choosing verbose equals one okay now we are ready to train now if we run this epoch one of 20 and we are training as you can see we are only seeing the loss value which is decreasing it means that my loss is actually decreasing with every epoch okay well that's really good we see here that it increased a bit, but that's totally okay, at least for this simple case. And by that, we have trained a model to try to predict these numbers. We still have a few more steps to do, but initially our model is ready to predict something. Let's see how. What I would like to do right now is to actually see the performance of this training. Now, right here, we can simply say that the loss is already decreasing, but for large epochs, large data, I would like to visualize this. So let's see how we can do that. We are going to use the matplotlib one more time. So we'll say plt.plot. What do I want to plot now? I want to plot the history. Remember, history contained information regarding this loss. So before plotting, let me just show you quickly. If I say history history dot keys I called it history here sorry so history you'll see that I have only the loss information recorded and that is expected actually when we are using regression okay so how can we plot these keys it's very simple. All we need to do is just say plt dot plot and then history dot history and then pass the key which is loss. And that's it. Let's label. So plt dot x label is going to be the epoches. This is my x axis. And then plt dot y label will be my loss okay then we are ready to plot so we'll be say plt dot show and as you can see the loss was too high and it did drop down this is the pattern that we should be looking for when we are training any neural model 
we need to make sure that the loss is starting high and dropping to its lowest possible value because the less we see the loss dropping the more accurate our model is going to be now we have illustrated the performance now how can we predict a value actually it's very simple all we need to do is just to say predict is equal to and then call which model do you want to predict with which is model in our case remember we are using model right model dot predict is the method we are going to call then you would need to pass the value you would like to predict and it should be in the form of an array okay so we need a double array like that or a double list like that and just pass a value let's say i want to pass a value of 120. what is my expected output here well 120 and our function is 120 times 40 which is 4800 now if i try to print this prediction as you can see i got 4799.9 and that is a really good prediction right i mean this is a prediction model it's not going to give me the exact value but it will give me an approximation around it and that's good we got this number right here okay let's try something else maybe 400 400 times 40 is 1600 and this is also a very close approximation that's good now how about if we would like to actually see the plots of the prediction and the real values to compare them are they matching each other or not this is also very simple we would need to predict all the x here so i'm going to say predict my x all the data i would like to predict it okay so i passed it all of these points okay and i said hey go predict all of them i know that we already have the answers and that's the point i would like to not use this formula i would like to use my model to predict all of these values okay so we're good next why true values is when i actually multiply these by 40. okay so this is my y prediction let's call it because we are predicting through the model the result of y and here is my y true meaning this is the actual formula now if i try to plot this they should be on top of each other okay so let me just plot them quickly so i'm going to say plt dot plot y prediction and again i'm going to be plotting y true on the same plot but oh we forgot to pass the x as well so we need the x-axis and as you can see we see one line does this mean that they are matching well let's use different color here maybe this will be color equals red this will be color equals orange maybe the orange is on top now if i try to plot them the other way around you'd see that the red is on top that means these two lines are actually on top of each other that's really good how about if i want to see if my model is generalizing this well what do i mean by that let's take different points okay we will use the same formula but maybe i will change the range here a little bit to make it maybe 40,000 points okay so let's try this now as you can see even with 40,000 points meaning i increased my x-axis you'll see that i'm predicting well okay that's really good now what if i change the shift by maybe 500 well we are still predicting correctly that's good what if i change this multiplication well if i change the shift maybe with a way larger number than this 
as you can see now the orange is deviating a little bit from the red but still we are getting pretty accurate predictions now for very large data for a very large shift as you can see we are starting to deviate meaning for a very large shift in the line this model is not really predicting it and that's really expected because we have trained it for a certain range and it actually performed well even on a larger range than what we have trained it on but now when we increase the shift a lot you'll see that well it's not predicting correctly because the red is actually the predictions and the actual values are here so my point of changing this and showing it to you guys is that to see if you want to compare your prediction with your true values this is what you need to do you need to take the formula of your true value and you need to use the model to predict your points right you use these two formulas here one as a formula one as a model you pass them you pass them to the x points and you plot them and you see the difference okay let's return it to minus 20 and we're good and the prediction is pretty good all right so there is one more thing that i would like to talk about we have created a deep neural network and the question is what would happen if we shrink it down i want you to see this effect by yourself so let me just delete those deep neural nets and create a shallow net with maybe only five neurons let's see what would happen to the loss we have if we run this and try to plot the prediction versus ground truth we will see that even with a very simple neural network we are still getting a good match a good prediction so we did not really need all of that a huge network but i wanted to show you how to build one now let me reduce this further let's say i have only five neurons let's see the performance now if we try this one more time we'll see that we are still predicting good results well even with five neurons because this is actually a very simple function let me even reduce it more let's make only three neurons now let's try again even with three neurons we are able to predict this function let's reduce it more let's create only two neurons let's try this and again we are still getting a good match okay let's create it with only one neuron okay let's plot this and as you can see we are getting no prediction right now at all so actually for such a simple function we can get away with even two neurons and that's really impressive let's try again hit it with two let's plot this even though it took a little bit more time to converge for the loss to be a little bit consistent it really did well so let me try to compile this as you can see there is a very small difference between the predicted and the true values okay that's really good now let's try to predict a single value just to see what is the difference exactly here i'm going to be passing the value seven maybe and let's print it out the y prediction okay for so for seven we got 310 and the correct answer is actually 280 so there is a bit of a difference actually but still we are getting good results right i mean we are still predicting an approximation to that function now i'm gonna go and let's try 20 neurons here i'm gonna run it and as you can see it is converging because the loss is decreasing let's try this try this we got 285 instead of 280 so we're still good 
Now I want to show you what happens if I decrease the number of epochs. Let's say that my epochs are only two. Okay. Now we trained it for only two epochs. And as you can see, there is a huge drop. But will it be enough to predict? Well, no. See, training your data for only a couple of times is not enough to create a good prediction. You need to pass your data through the whole neural network multiple times so that the weights can be learned and the model can predict good values. Now, let's try maybe five epochs. Okay, let's plot this. As we can see, it's decreasing. That's good. Now, let's see the difference. As you can see, with five epochs, we got some pretty good values. Okay, we got 305, which is good, actually. So, the number of, of epochs is very important. And also, the, how deep or shallow is your network is also important. Okay, now you might say, well, why don't we just create a large network every time and we can get away with our model not predicting? This does not work. This would lead to something called overfit. And with large networks, we tend to overfit. So with large networks, we usually tend to have an overfit issues, meaning that your model is going to learn your training data but it will have a really hard time generalizing for new data. It will memorize your data so that if you just give it a new data, it would not know what to do with it, and it will give false predictions. Okay. Okay, so what I want to do right now is complicate this function a little bit, because linearity is simple. I'm going to multiply this function by itself three times plus x times x plus x plus or minus 2500. Okay, so right now the y is not actually in a linear relationship with x. It is a nonlinear relationship. Now, if I try to plot this, I will be getting something like that. It's better to plot nonlinearity with a scatter, especially if we have enough data points. And this is the function that we've got. All right, let's see how well can we predict this function. I'm going to keep my shallow network and try to see what would happen. I trained it for five times, and as you can see, the loss is enormous. This is not even normal. If I try to plot this, I will see that it is decreasing, but is this decreasing enough? So here we need to copy the same formula in order to start calculating. And we need to change plot to scatter for both of these. Run it. And as you can see, we are getting a pretty bad predictions. This is my function. These are my true values, and this is the predicted value. That's not really good. So we really need a more advanced function here. Let me try to create a bigger network. Maybe here we have 100, here we have 50. Let's have here maybe a 20. And epochs wise, I'm going to go for 20. Okay. Let me run them. Let's run this. Loss is decreasing, but is it enough? That's the question. Let's plot. We see that it's decreasing. That's good. And that's good. Now we are able to predict it. As you can see here, in the negative values, we are still having some off values, actually. But that's a good start. Now we are able to approximate this function. Really good. I mean, we did not, unlike polynomial regression, we don't have to predict the A, the B, the C values for the polynomials. We just create a network, a nested network, and it just extracts this function. This is the beauty, and the, this is where the power resides when we talk about neural networks. Okay, 
Now, let's say I train this even further, maybe for 40 Ibotches. Let's see what's going to happen. Now, loss is decreasing, hopefully. Good. Now, as we can see here, we are having a drop. Okay. And the function is being mimicked perfectly. Well, that's really good. But how do we know that this model is not really overfitting? How do I know that since I'm predicting again the same data, I'm not falling into the overfit issue? Well, we'll be figuring that out. Now to answer that question, are we overfitting? So far, we were training our model with this data, and we were also evaluating here with the same data. And that's the issue. Sometimes a neural network will memorize your data. Let's say it memorized all of this data, and it's not really learning how to predict new data. This is why we will be dividing our data into training and testing. We've been doing that before in the data science section, actually, and I would like to do it one more time here. Now we are adding a new cell, and let's import the sklearn library, and we need the train test module. Selection, import, train, test, split. Okay, now let us actually split them. So we have x-train, then x-test, y-train, y-test. This should equal to train underscore test underscore split. Let's pass the x, the y, and the test size. Let's say it is 20%. So the validation, the testing will get 20%. Okay. Now, how cool would it be if my model was actually sending some epoches for training, then actually sending some epoches for testing? What do I mean by that? Let me show you in a minute. Let's say that this is my data. And we have the X train being 0 0.1, 0 0.2, 0 0.3. And then we have the Y train, which say it's a square function. So here we have 1, 4, and 9. Now my X test, let's say, is around 25% of the data, meaning one data if we only have four points, right? So here, let's say 0.4, and here we will be having 16, okay? This is my Y test. Okay, that's good. Now, this is my neural network, let's say, A and N. And when we are training, we will be sending those train values and here we will be having our y train right so this x train this is y train and here some calculations is happening and then we have a feedback for the back propagation right so the model here compares the y train to the value that came from here and then it calculates the error. Now, this is one epoch. If I add validation to this process, then I would be having the following. This same ANN is going to be passed X test, but it won't be passed any Y test. There is no Y test. This is a validation step, meaning I will be sending the X test and I will be waiting for the result. And there is no backpropagation in the validation. Here I am 
testing my data. It's the same as giving individual values to see if my prediction is right or wrong. Okay, so one epoch right now is going to consist of two stages. One, train. Two, validate. What's going to happen here, the error is going to be calculated, but it won't propagate back. Okay, so here we are calculating the error with this Y label, but the thing is, we won't be using this Y test right here to calculate any backpropagation. We just calculate the error and that's it. No backpropagation, no correction, because we are validating. Okay, now let us see this in action. Here I'm going to be passing X train and Y train, right? It's not X, Y anymore, we have split them. And I'm going to add something here. You can add it anywhere in the function, actually. I'm going to say validation data is equal to x test and y test. That's it. Now let's try to train this one more time. Okay, we did not compile this. Let's compile this first. And this comes next. Okay. Here we go. Okay. Now, let me plot this. You'll see that it's decreasing, but since I added a validation step, let me show you what else is going to happen. If I create a new cell and I try to print the keys for the history, we've tried this in the beginning of the ANN, we'll see that now we have validation loss and loss. We have a new parameter. Remember, I told you that we calculate the loss, but we don't do backpropagation. Well, this calculated loss can be seen as well. Let's plot it. How about that? We're going to plot the loss, and we are going to plot the validation loss. Okay. Now, maybe let's give this a color of, I don't know, orange. And as you can see, the loss is decreasing and the validation loss is also decreasing. That's good. All right. So let's see. Did we actually learn something? What I want to do now in this prediction section, I would like to pass the X test. Remember, back propagation and Model tuning is happening only with exit train because, as I said, tests do not change the weights because there is no backpropagation. Okay, so what if I use this data right now, all of it, in my prediction? Let's see how accurate are we. So here we have x test, and we're going to replace all of these x's with x test. One, two, three four five six and here the x-axis will be also x test okay see what we're doing now we are just trying to see the accuracy of this and as you can see we have a pretty good function we split it our data and we still got a very good approximation meaning that our model did not really overfit and we are predicting the values that are in this certain range that is really great. Let us start a new exercise. We are going to be predicting the prices of a certain house through the data set of houses that we have. Okay, so this example is going to be about multiple features and those multiple features are going to be used in order to predict that price. Let us start by importing a couple of libraries. We have the pandas. And we have NumPy. Now let's read this data and take a look at it. It is already attached in this lecture, so you can download it and follow along. So read CSV and let me put the path here. And this is my data frame. Here we have a dot. Okay. Now let's see this data frame, DF head. 
and we have the longitude, the latitude, this is the location of the house. We have the median age, how old is this house, we have how many rooms, how many bedrooms. By the way, here it's predicting a block, not really a house, it's a block that contains multiple apartments maybe. We have the population, how many people are in that block, we have the households in there, we have the median income, median house value, and where it is near the ocean. That's a pretty cool data set. And you can get it by downloading the attachment of this lecture. All right, so now we are ready to continue. Let's create a new cell. As you can see here, one of our columns is actually containing strings. Neural networks do not really deal well with strings and most of machine learning algorithms. So this is why we will be using encoding. The encoding method we will be using is something that is existing already in the pandas library, which is the get dummies. So let's start pre-processing first. I'm going to be dropping any NAs or NANs that exist in this panda data frame. And this can be simply done by saying df is equal to df dot drop an A. Of course, the axis is zero because we are on the x-axis or the rows. Execute it. Let's continue. Now we need to encode all of this. So how can we do that? Well, we just say df is equal to pd dot get dummies. I know the name does not really reflect that it is encoding anything, but this is what get dummies do. Then we have df, then we have columns, and we need to specify what do we want to encode. Well, we just need this ocean proximity to be encoded. And let's just print the head, say df.head maybe, and let's execute it. Uh, we need columns equal to, let's continue, okay, we're good. Now, as you can see, we have encoded this. And the way we have encoded it is with the one hot encoder, okay? One hot encoder is much better than encoding with 0, 1, 2, 3, because, well, as we've said, 1, 2, 3 could give weights that maybe the 2 is better than the 1, or the 3 is better than the 2. But with this, in the way like that, we are eliminating the possibility that any of the options here is considered better than the other, which because they are strings, and it makes no sense that a string is better than another one, at least in this case. All right. All right, so right now we will be pre-processing this data by splitting it and scaling it. So let's import the minimum maximum scalar from sklearn and we will be importing the train test split from sklearn.preprocessing import min max scalar and from sklearn model selection import train test split and we're good we have added those libraries now let's prepare the features and the label the feature we label it with a large x as usual and then we would be saying df dot drop what are my features well it is everything except what i want to predict what do i want to predict I want to predict the median house value, which is the price of the house, okay? I'm going to be dropping that because we don't want the predicted value to be in the features, right? And we need to specify the axis. It's, of course, the zero axis. Next, we have the Y, which is my feature, which is my median house. So it's going to be equal to DF and median house. We're good. Okay, now let's split our data. So we have x train as usual, x test, then y train, and y test. This will equal to train underscore test underscore split. 
x, y. And what is my test size here? I want to allocate 20% of my data for testing, so 0 0.2, and we're good. Now, let's scale this data. Remember, we always scale the features. We don't scale the label because when we are working with artificial neural networks or in machine learning algorithms in general, not all of them, it's always better to have all of your data on the same scale. Okay, this will help dealing with all the data equally. Okay, so how can we do that? We're just going to say scalar is equal to min max scalar. Then let's start scaling. We have the x train is going to be equaling to scalar dot fit underscore transform. We are fitting and transforming at the same time of x train, of course. Okay, so we are creating a scalar object and then we are using it on this x train and we are updating the x train. Okay. We'll be doing the same thing for the x test. So we have x test is equal to scalar dot fit underscore transform, and then we have x test. Of course, you could use the fit and transform in separate steps, but there is this function that combines them together, so why not? Okay, now let me execute this. Oh, we need to execute the libraries first, and then this. Uh, median house value is not found in the axis oh i think we made a mistake with the axis it should be axis one yeah because we are dropping a column actually not a row so yeah all right we still have train test split is not defined because we have a very simple typo so this should be split not the spilt okay we're good and Right now, how about we just print the shapes of what we have, right? So we could say print x shape and y shape. Well, we have 20,433 features to work with. Okay, not so bad. Let us also take a look at the data after we have scaled it. So we can just type x train. And as you can see, it seems that all the values are actually in between 0 and 1. And that's really good. How can we make sure that it is in between 0 and 1? Because there is a lot of data that we cannot see. We can always use the numpy unique function to see what are the unique data that we have. And it will order them in a ascending way. So we can just say mp unique x train and yes the maximum value we have is actually one all right so the data is actually between zero and one then that's really good this is a very good scalar okay all right so right now we are ready to build our model to save time i have already typed those library those modules that we need to import we know already the sequential the dense and I'm adding something called early stopping. Okay, so compile it. And let's dig into writing our model. Of course, we will be starting with our sequential, which will load all of our neurons. Next, we have model.add. We have dense. Open a parenthesis. Let's use a three hidden layers model. And the first hidden layer will have 1,000 neurons. Input shape. What is my input shape? We could write it directly, or maybe we can just use something else. We can say x train dot shape one. So this is my x train, right? And this is my shape one, which is 13 features. This will be easier so that if I change my data set, I don't need to come here and change it myself. Then we have our activation, which is relu. Okay. We need to say input shape equal to. Oh, okay. We are getting a problem here because the input shape, we need to add a comma, right? Because we are passing a shape right here. So we need two entries. Yeah, 
that's much better. Okay, now let us continue. We need to add another hidden layer. This will be with a size of 500 neurons. And we don't need the input shape anymore, right? And yeah, let's create the third hidden layer, which will be with a size of 250 neurons. And finally, the output layer, which will be a dense with only one neuron. And this time, I'm going to be trying to specify explicitly what is my activation function, which will be linear. Okay, and we're good. Now, if you want to see a summary of the model you have, sometimes you bring models from the internet and you would like to see the details of how its architecture looks like. So you can just say model.summary. And here you can see that it contains one, two, three, four dense layers. One of them is the output, of course. And here we have 250, 500, and 1000. And here you can see how many parameters can be trained and how many parameters cannot be trained. Well, in our case, all of the parameters can be trained. It's all of those weights. Parameters here, what we're talking about are those weights. So we have this many weights that we want to train. Okay. Now, one last thing that I would like to add is the early stopping. Early stopping will help your model stop the training if there is no improvement at all. Remember, we are trying to minimize the loss as much as possible. Let's say we are training for 500 epoches, and let's say that after the 50th epoches, we until the 200th epoches, we did not get any improvement on the loss. It means that we have something wrong either with our data or with our model. So we need to stop training. There is no point in continuing. This is where early stopping comes in. So I'm going to be saying stop is equal to early stopping. And we will be passing the following parameters. We need to say what are we monitoring what should we be monitoring so that if it did not improve i'm gonna be stopping well i want to improve my validation loss right because maybe the loss in training is decreasing but what i care about is when i am testing on data that i did not train am i getting good results or not is the loss for those is decreasing or not and then we have the mode well, since this is a validation loss, I want to be looking at the minimum, right? If I was looking at accuracy, which we will see in classification, I would be looking for the maximum accuracy, right? But here, loss, I will be looking for the minimum loss. Then we have patience. How many epoches do I want to wait before I want to stop the training? Let's say 30 epoches, okay? This will vary from model to model, from problem to problem, but initially let's start with 30. And we have something called restore best weights, which means that when we stop, we will take the model with the best loss, okay, with the best parameters. So this will be true. And we're done. Now, finally, the last step that we've implemented many times, which is the history oh, and the fitting. So we have model.fit and we will be passing x train, of course, and y train. We need the validation data because we want to be validating while we are training. And this will equal to x test and y test. Now, in order to utilize this early stopping, we need to call it here. So we have callbacks, and we pass it as a list, all of our callbacks. There are multiple types of callbacks that we can use, but for us, we just want to use this stop, right? Now, for how many epoches do I want to be running this? Let's say before 100 epoches, my batch size, let's keep it at 20, and the verbose is 1, okay? And let us hit on train. Here we have two commas. Okay. 
It says you must compile your model before training. Why is that? Because we still need to add the compilation. So we need to take care of our back propagation, right? So model.compile and we need to choose an optimizer. So optimizer is going to equal to stop add verbose. Okay. So before executing the cell, we need to add the back propagation, right? So we'll be saying here model.compile and let us choose the optimizer. It will be Adam. Then we have our loss, which will be the mean squared error. And I would like to add a metric. Metrics will help me measure the performance of my model. And the metric I'm going to be choosing is called mean absolute error. Okay. There is mean squared error and mean absolute error. There are multiple types of metrics that we can use for regression. And I'm going to be choosing the MAE or the mean absolute error. Okay. Now we are ready to hit on run. Of course, we need here an equal sign. And let's run. And the training has started. Let's take a moment to see the result. And now the training is done. That's really good. And as we can see, if we take a look at the loss, we will see that it is actually decreasing. I'm going to import history as well so that we can plot whatever we have stored right here. And we will be starting to plot the performance. Let us finalize this model right now. Now we need to evaluate how well did we do. We want to see and sketch the loss. We have done this multiple times, so let's do it fast this time. Let us plot all the keys that we have. So we have history, dot history, dot keys. Let us recompile this and try again now. We have a typo again here, so it's okay. Let's copy it as it is. Now we have loss, MAE, validation loss, and validation MAE. Why do we have these MAEs? Because we specifically said that we want to see the mean absolute error. So we were just trying to see how is this mean absolute error is looking like. Let us plot this really quickly. So I'm going to say MAE is equal to, let me put this in a variable called history. And well, let us extract that. So we have history and we have the MAE. Okay, we have MAE and validation MAE. So this is MAE and this is the val MAE. Let's put them in a variable. And let's start plotting. PLT dot plot. We have the MAE first and I'm going to label this on the X label. And let's just add a small label for that and we're going to call it MEE and let us repeat the same thing for the validation MEE. And here we have this label. Now let's label the X label. So we have plt.x label is going to be called epoches. And let's try to plot this. So we'll say plt.show. Okay. Here we need to remove this key. And let's try again. We still did not import PLT, so let us import it. Let's compile that we have imported it. That's good. Now let's try to compile this one more time. And here we go. As you can see, let us give different colors. So maybe the MAE will have a color of blue. And this one will have a color of red. So validation is actually decreasing, but not decreasing as much as the training, as you can see. But we can see that we have a decreasing pattern and that's 
really what we are looking for. Well, this won't be a super accurate model because it's really hard to predict exactly what is the house price regarding all of these parameters because, well, there isn't a very good fit function that could give you 100% or even 95% precisely what is the price of a certain house. This is why we will be getting only an approximation. Now, let's see what does this approximation actually look like, okay? We want to plot the prediction versus the actual. So I'm going to say here y, as usual, y true values is going to be equal to the y test, for example. And the y predicted is going to equal to model.predict. And then here we will have x test, okay? So these are the grounded truth. And here we have the prediction. Now, let us plot these. But what is the x-axis for those? Well, let's create an x-axis for those. We will be using the line space, which is an NumPy function. So we're going to say x-axis is equal to np.line space. Minimum is zero. We are starting at zero, let's say. What is the length of this x-axis? Well, it is the... It, is, it depends on how many points do I have here. So it is the length of x test. And well, for how many steps? Well, the steps are actually the length of x test as well, right? So this is what is the minimum, what is the maximum, and for how many steps do I want to divide it? Well, I want to divide it to one step at a time for every single point I have here. This is why my maximum and the steps here are the same. Okay, this is my x-axis. Now we are ready to start plotting. We won't be plotting all the data. This will be a really crowded plot. So we will be defining how many points do we want to plot. So let's say I want to plot the first maybe 20 points. And here we are going to say plt.plot. We will say I want to plot my x-axis only to the number of points that I have given. And then we have the, uh, let's say this is the Y predict, and I'm going to give it a color of red. Okay, now I'm going to do the same thing, but for the grounded truth. So this will be Y true. Here it's going to be blue. And well, we still need to specify how many points do we need here. So let's do this for this and for this, because we only want to plot a certain number of points. And we're good. Let me plot this. So I'll say plt dot show go. Uh, OK, it's called lin space. We have no E here. And let's go again. OK, as you can see, the predictions are close. Now, let me change here a plot to scatter for my ground truth. As you can see, the points, most of them, are really close to the plot I am plotting here. So the results are pretty good. We are still able to mimic this. There is always an outsider point where they are not really fitting because the feature have some special cases regarding these entry points, these houses. So sometimes maybe the seller is just putting a price that is way higher than the market or lower than the market. This could happen. This is why we would have outliers like that. So let's try some different points. Let me uh, put the lower and the upper end. So I'm going to say P is equal to maybe 5 or maybe 20 up to 40. So I'm going to be sampling all the points from the 20th point to the 40th point. So I'm going to be saying here from P to N, from P to N, from P to N, and from P to N. Now, let's go again. Well, those are different points. And we see that we have more outliers. But still, some points are still fitting. So the prediction will go depending on how good your data is as well. It's not only about the model, it's about the data that you have obtained. Okay, and by that we have finalized this price prediction. Now it's time to talk about ANN, but for classification. We have been talking about regression for some time right now, but now I want to talk about classification. 
And I'm going to just draw quickly a neural network that contains four input nodes and many, many hidden layers. This could go on. And then we have three output nodes. Okay, one, two, three. And let's interconnect them really quick just for the visualization of it. Okay, let's assume that they are connected together. All right, does the same thing here. Every node going to every node. Okay, and finally here we have those connected as well. This is the ugliest neural network I've ever drawn, but well, it serves the purpose. Okay, now let's say that I would like to classify an image. And this image is only 4 pixels. Okay, and let's say here we have images of circles. We have also images for triangles and for squares. Okay. And all the image are just 2 by 2. What I would like to do right now, I would like to predict which class do we have. Let's say that this class is for circle, this is for a triangle, and this is for a square. What I want to do is, I want my neural network to produce a probability at the output. Okay, So it will produce a list like that, that says, okay, for circle, it's probably around 10%. For a triangle, this picture is probably around 70%. And as a square, it's probably only 20%. Those should add up to 100%, right? Okay, so this is what I would like to do. I would like to classify what is the highest probability that this is a circle. I would like to classify if this is circle, triangle, or square by taking a look at what is the highest probability that we are returning, okay? But the question is, how can we pass a picture to this neural network? Well, we, this is a 2 by 2, right? So we have 4 pixels. We would create a neural network that has inputs equaling to the pixels we have. So if we have maybe a 20 by 20 image, we would need a 400 input neural network. Okay, but how can we pass it? We need to flatten this image. So the image initially looks like this. I want to convert it to look like this. What do I mean by that? Well, after all, this is just a pixel with value. Let's assume that all of those are grayscale. Okay, those are not a colored image, just grayscale, meaning that every Pixel is just a value. This could be 255, this could be 15, this could be 7, and this could be 2. All I need to do is flatten it so that it looks like that. Here's the 255, 15, 7, and the 2. And then I will be passing this just simply like that. 2 will go here, 7 will go here, 15 will go all the way here, and 25 will go here. And then I will be running this. Now my activation function right here won't be linear, won't be sigmoid. It's going to be softmax. We have talked about softmax before. Because softmax is going to return a value in between minus 1 and 1. And this is perfect to return a probability. Now if we got a minus 1, we are going to take the absolute value. So all of our values will be in between 0 and one only okay so if we got a value of 0 0.5 i know this is 50 percent if i got 0 0.9 i know this is a 90 percent okay and then pike propagation will work as usual so this is how classification work for images with a and n now later we will learn more algorithms and better algorithms for image classification but it's really important that you understand how an ANN can actually categorize images as well. Let's dig into some code now. 
Welcome back guys. So right now we are going to take a look at the data set we are going to be using to classify images. We have three folders which are circle, squares and triangle. All of them are drawn by hand. And we have around 100 images right here. As you can see, everything is drawn by hand and all the images have the same size. This is the circles. Here are the squares as well. And we can see the triangles here. All of these images are 28 by 28 pixels. And we are going to create a model that will classify what it is seeing. Is it seeing a triangle? Is it seeing a circle? Or is it seeing a square? So let's get started. What is the first thing we need to do in any data science project? Well, it is pre-processing the data. So let's get started. We need to import a couple libraries, which are the pandas. We also need OpenCV here, so import CV2, and we have NumPy, and finally we need OS, because we need to be reading data from a certain path. Let's run this, and what I want to do right now is to actually go to every directory and read all the images. But first I need to get a list of all the images in the folder. Well, this is the path that I will be using. You can use your own and you can download this data set from the attachment. What I need is I want to go to every folder and copy the names of all the files. Now, after I copy all the names from all the files, then I can iterate over every name and use OpenCV to read that image and store it, right? So let's do that. I'm going to create here a dictionary for the names so let's say for the circles i'm going to be creating a list same thing for triangles and for squares okay now i will be storing the names of the files here now what is my base path well i'm going to define a variable here i'm going to call it base path and it's going to be also a dictionary and it will be for circles it won't be a list, it's going to be just a single pass for the base path of the circles. So in my case, this is the path for the circles. Let's copy it and paste it here. I will be doing the same for every single one of those. This is for my triangles. I only need to change the last folder name. And finally, we have the squares. Okay. Now, how can we get all the pictures? We will be using the OS library. Let me give you a simple example. If I, for example, just say os.list directory, and I just say maybe base path circles. If I execute this, I will be getting all the images, as you can see right here. And now I have all the images. Well, how about we add all of those images into the circles here? Okay, so let's do that. We're going to say image name, and I'm going to say circles. And since here we have a list, we can simply append. And I would like to get this output, right? We just did it. So we need os.list directory, and then just say base path. And then we would say, well, circles. Okay, this is a step by step on how to get all the files from your folder. Okay, I would like to do this for all the keys in my image name. So, how about we do that using a loop? So, we'll say for k for key in image name img name okay so i'll be getting all the keys here so dot keys so every iteration will get me every single key of those circles triangles squares and then just pass the key here okay oh sorry it's not let's call it key it's totally okay all right now if i just print image name just quickly You'll see that I have circles, it contains all of these paths, I have triangles, and I have squares. Now let's see what is the limit. Now let's see, uh, maybe 
the circles. Now let's see what is the size of this. And let's add a zero here. We have 100 because we are putting a list inside the list, you know, because this is a list here and this one is already returning a list. So this is why we need to access element zero. We could just see the lengths of all of them if they are correct. Just double checking. Uh, we need to add print, another print here, and a final print here for the squares. And all the data was loaded. That's really good. What we've done right now is just get the paths of all the images that we have. Let's continue. The next step is to actually use OpenCV to read these paths that I have stored. Okay. And then we want to flatten the images. Remember, we said if we have a grid as an image, we need to flat it out in order to pass it to a neural network. Okay. We also need to convert this image into grayscale just to make sure that it is a grayscale. And we need to normalize it. Let's see how we can do that. First, we need to iterate over all the pictures. So we will say 4K in image name dot keys. So we are iterating over the keys right here. Then I want to iterate over every single image inside. So now I am in key circle. Now let's iterate inside the images for N for name in image name K zero because we have a list inside the list let's construct the path so the path that we are going to read from is called os.path.join what do we want to join here we need the base path with the key and we also need the image name okay so for every key let's say in circle we are joining the, the image name which is in circle and then we are appending to it the base path, which is this whole thing. So it would be this whole thing plus the name of the image. And then we can pass this to OpenCV to read the correct path. Okay, now we will be saying image is equal to cv2.image read. And then we need the path. We need to read this as a grayscale. So it will be cv2 dot i am read underscore gray scale next i would like to convert this image into an umpy array so that i can process it further so it will be image np dot array image now we have converted it and let's just run this do we have any issues we have no issues now there is one more thing I want you to take a look at these images. As you can see, the background is white and the image is black. I don't want this. We will perform much better if our images, especially the simple ones, if we have the background black and the object as white. Why is that? Because the background is something that I really don't care about. And while I am processing it, it will be all values zero. And only the line inside will have values from 0 to 255 in case we are in grayscale, right? So I'd rather have my algorithm take care only of this line that is drawn inside. So this is why I want to convert it into a grayscale. This will accelerate the training. I'm not saying that if you don't invert them, you won't get good results. No, what I'm saying is, the algorithm will converge faster if you have the background as zeros and the actual figure as ones or a range between 0 and 255. This is why we are going to say image is equal to cv2 underscore not image. This will co invert everything. So the white will be black and the black will be white. Okay. Now, what I want to do is I don't want the figure to be in the range between 0 and 255. I want the drawing of the circle itself to be only with the value 1, because here we don't have any complex colors. All we have is just a simple drawing. 
And why would I have multiple colors for that, right? So I would like to say here image is equal to image larger than zero is equal to one. Meaning that for any value that is larger than zero in this image, just convert it to one. Uh, sorry, here there is no equal sign. Yeah. Okay. And I actually want to show you what we are doing as well. So now after we've done that, let's flatten this image. How to do that? It's very simple. We will say image is equal to image dot flatten. Okay. Now the image won't be a grid. It will be just a single line of pixels instead of being a grid of pixels. Now it's easy to pass it to a neural network. Now, what I want to do is, I would like to create another dictionary here. I'm going to call it data. And it's going to contain two things. One of them is the label. And the other is the flattened image. Okay, I don't want to store the image as a grid. I care about it as a flattened. Okay, now we are flattened. Now we can append it. So we can add this flattened image to this dictionary. So I'm going to say data flatten dot append image okay and i also want the label well what is the label here it is the key right because in every iteration i am choosing a key and i am reading all of its images so i'm starting with circle triangles and then squares so this k is actually the actual label of what i am reading so all I need to do here is just append k. Okay, if we run this, uh, yeah, we did not compile this. Now let's run this. Okay, we need a dot here. All right, we're good. Now I just want to show you what we are doing exactly here. Let's say I want to read this image just for the sake of demonstration. Image cv2 dot im read and then just a path, any path that we have reached. Okay, next what I'm saying is I would like to convert it. Now, if I just show this image, you'll see that it is the original image, right? There it is. Now, what I would like to do is invert it. So I'm going to say image is equal to cv2 dot bitwise underscore not image. Now, as you can see, the black has become white and the white is black. Okay. Really good. Now, how would I know that the values here are not actually zeros and ones? Well, it's very simple actually. Now, if I just say here nb.unique to see what values, what unique values do I have in my image, and I just print it out, okay? I don't want to show this image anymore. You'll see that I have values between 0 and 217. And the reason is when we have PNG images, after you store them, even though, as we've seen the image as only a white circle or square, it's not actually entirely white. It consists of all of these colors, and I don't want that. I want it to be only with one color, which is a value one. Now, if I try to show this image, I will get a pitch black image when we take a look at it by the naked eye. But since this is a very, very small variant of black, because this is only one degree above black, the computer will recognize it, but our eye cannot really recognize it. Okay, so this is why here I'm converting all the zeros to one. So let's see what will happen. If I, for example, do this and compile, you'll see that my unique values now are only zeros and ones. And this will make the job of my ANN way easier. Now, after we've done that, what I want to do is just create a data frame. So I'm going to say data is equal to pd.data frame data and i would like to print the head so data.head small d now let's compile everything well now i have a label and a flattened data but this is not exactly what i want let's talk about the data format that we would like to have so we have multiple pictures all of them are 4 by 4 pixels, okay? It doesn't matter what is the class or the label of each of them. What I would like to have is a label 
column this is my table which will tell me this is let's say a circle another entry maybe for a triangle and one for a square one for a circle and it repeats now what i would like to have for the other columns is the pixel index so this is pixel index one this is two this is three this is four and remember these are flattened right now so they look like that so i would be doing this like this is pixel one then two then three then four since all of my images are in this dummy case two by two it means that i could have a consistent table that contains well columns for every pixel okay so this is also one two three four so let's say this is a circle here the first image and it has values one two three four so i would be having one two three four okay uh, let's say these are zero one zero one so i would be having here zero one zero one so what i mean is that these are the pixels this is pixel index one pixel index two three and four and we will repeat this for every entry but what we have right now is something like we have label and we have flatten okay and label a circle and then the flatten is all the values of all the pixels one two three all the way to let's say in our case now we have whatever the outcome of 28 times 28 right this is what, not what we want we want to be able to explode these into something like this let's see how we can do that we have talked about on how can we convert this table we have talked about on the format that we want this table to be in i'm going to create a new cell and we are going to start doing that the first thing i want to do is to create the columns now the columns that we need corresponds for every pixel right column one is pixel one two three etc this can be done so easily if we say columns is equal to we'll be using list comprehension x for x in range zero to len data flat zero remember this so we are simply creating a list of values that are between zero and whatever the length of flat is because the length of flat is actually how long is my is actually the length of my image after we have flattened it which corresponds to how many pixels do we have right okay now if i just show you what this column quickly called flatten here okay so it's just a simple list of all the values corresponding to each pixel so these are my pixel values okay what's next we would like to create a new data frame that has that format that we've talked about so this will be df is equal to pd dot data frame and then we will be passing the columns so this is columns is equal to col we are just initializing this data frame okay next now it's time to take every entry from flatten here and put it as a row the way to do that to take a list and convert it to a row is by using panda series so for example if i say pd dot series just for example here and then i pass the data flatten let's say for the first element okay as you can see now we have exploded that list into individual values see now if we simply append this to our data frame they will be converted to a row so I, all i need to do is now to create a for loop so for i in range zero to the len of data flatten let's say for the first element since all the elements are full and then i need to do here is just say df is equal to df dot append okay and then here we need to pass ignore index equals true this append method for data frame in pandas is going to take a series and convert it into a row that will be added to my data frame okay now if i just simply print df head afterwards and uh, let's execute this is the format that we are looking for right those are the pixel indexes 
And this is for every single image, image 0, image 1, 2, 3, 4, and these are the values that it have for every single pixel. Great. Now we could add the label here, but since we will be training this data and splitting it into features and labels, we don't need to add it. Let's leave it like that. Now we have this DF, which contains all the pixels, and we have the data label here, which contains all my labels. They are two separate data variables, but that's totally okay. Okay. Now to the step that we have done multiple times so far. So let's do it quickly. We are going to be splitting our data and then building the model. So here is our libraries. Now we want to encode the label. The label contains names like circle, triangle, squares, and we would like to encode them. The easiest way to do that is by creating a Y here. We will be saying pd.getDummies. We have talked about getDummies before, which is a one-hot encoder. And then we will be encoding the data label. Now, if we are to print this Y pretty quickly. Uh, here we have layers. As you can see now, we have them encoded like that. Circles, squares, and triangles. And our X is going to equal to the data frame. This. This is my features, right? And here is my labels. Now, X and Y are ready. And we are ready to split them. Let us quickly convert these to NPy array. So we'll be saying here simply NPy.array. Let us specify that they are mp.int64. This won't really matter, but sometimes I just like to specify what is the type here. Same thing here. NP.array DF NP.integer64. Now let's split. So we have x train, x test, y train, y test. Let's leave the test size at 20% as well, just as usual. Now, if we try to execute this, okay, I think we have a small mistake here. Yeah, here. We need to take the size not of the flattened zero, but we need to take the size of flattened actually. We are looking at how many data points do we have, not how many pixels, right? So now if I recompile this from the beginning, let's recompile everything. And we're good. So we had a very small mistake over there, but everything sorted out. Now let's start building our model. We need sequential as usual. And we need to create two hidden layers, large ones. And let's see how will we perform with only that. So we have model dot add dense 512. We'll be using number of neurons equaling to the two to the power n. And every hidden layer will be less than the one before it. Okay, so we need input shape which is equaling to the same number of pixels, which we can get from x train, for example. We need to put this in a parenthesis. We pass the shape as a double in parenthesis, in this case. Then we have activation. This will be relu. Let's see if everything is okay. It is. Now let's add one more layer of maybe 64 neurons. And we have no input shape. Now, this is something new. What should be our last layer? Well, our last layer, number of neurons should equal to the number of classes because this is classification. We have cleared that at the beginning of this classification A and N. So we will be creating, let's copy this, and create only three layers. And the activation function should be softmax because we need to return a probability between 0 and 1. Let's see the summary of this model. We have around 434,000 parameters or weights to be tuned. That's much more than what we have trained before. What's next? We need to prepare the backpropagation. And this is going to be different as well. So we'll say model.compile. Now, the loss function for classification is also different. It's going to be called categorical underscore cross 
entropy. This is the loss function that is used for classification. Optimizer is going to be Adam, as usual. And now we can use a metric that is called accuracy. Now, accuracy can be used only in classification. We can see how accurate our model is. Okay, and this is it. This is our backpropagation section. Now, let's continue. We need some early stopping, maybe. So we're going to say stop is equal to early stopping monitor is equal to i want to monitor the validation accuracy this time instead of the loss we'll be monitoring the validation accuracy and make sure that it is changing and increasing so here we need to say that the mod is max unlike what we have given it before we were using mod min for the loss we will be using mod max for the accuracy because we need the maximum accuracy now patience is equal to 40 and restore best weights is equal to true. Compile, we're good. Now let us import our history. Did we import history here? No, let's import it. Capital H. Now we're going to say here history is equal to model.fit. We have our X train, we have our Y train just as usual. We have validation data, which are the X test and Y test. I would like to validate while I am training to be able to get the accuracy here. We have a few callbacks, actually only one callback, which is the stop. I will be running this for maybe 100 epoches initially. Patch size is 20 and verbose equaling one. And let's hit on train. Okay, here it's categorical, sorry. And here we go, we are training right now. And as you can see, we have stopped at 41 because, well, we did not get any improvement for the first 40 epoches. We got a maximum of 0 0.3 and we never got past it. So the model stopped because of this. Okay. Now that we have trained the model, let's take a look at our accuracy and our loss. And to be honest, things doesn't look good because the accuracy is only 0 0.3. I mean, accuracy needs to be in the range of at least 80 or 0 0.8 in order to get some really good results. So right now, I don't think things looking good, but let's plot them and see what we can tune. Let's import matplotlib. Now, if we type history.history.keys, we will see that we have loss, we have accuracy, validation loss, validation accuracy. So now we are measuring multiple parameters. Let us plot validation accuracy and accuracy. Let us plot all of them, actually. So let's do that. We have accuracy first. And we still need a history here. Actually, to make things simple, let's just say that his is equal to history dot history. Okay, now we will be just saying here his. And let's continue. We have the validation accuracy. This will be equaling to val underscore accuracy. We also have the loss. And we have the validation loss. Now let's plot them. So we'll say plt dot plot. First we have accuracy. Color is blue. And let's plot validation accuracy as well. In red. Then we have plot show. As we can see here, validation accuracy is not really that good. Even the accuracy is not okay. Well, let us plot the loss and the validation loss just to take a look at the loss as well. The loss is decreasing, but also for the validation loss, things doesn't look good. So we still have a really bad model. Let's see if we can improve it. 
Well, we've seen that our performance is not really good, but how can we improve it? Well, the first thing to think about is how many data points do we have? Usually, when we talk about image processing and trying to classify images, we need a large amount of data because images are complex and they contain many pixels and the data is large, that's why we would need more data. So maybe 100 data is not quite enough. So we might need to be adding more data, which we will be talking about on how to do it in a minute. The reason for this poor performance could also be because of our network. Let's try to increase how deep is our network and also increase the number of neurons. So let's say here we have 2048. Let's say that here we have 1024. Let's add two more layers or maybe three more layers. This will be 256. Everything should be multiple of uh, 2 to the power n. In this case, it gives better performance usually. And here we have 16. Okay. Let's see if we increase the model to this size, if anything at all would make a difference. So I'm going to be compiling everything one more time. Let's run it. Will we get any better results? Well, the model stopped at 43 epoches. If we try to plot this, well, maybe the loss dropped a little bit more, but let's take a look at the validation. Okay, as we can see now, the, the validation accuracy is having more of a drop. And well, now as you can see here, even though the validation accuracy is decreasing but still we are at a really bad level which is 0.28 and that's not really a good validation accuracy so we tried increasing the size of this and well we didn't do well how about we create more data points how can we do that we can easily generate more data points by flipping all of our images so right now we have 100 image for every category but if we take every image and we flip it into all directions by 90 degrees, each photo would yield four photos, right? We have the original one, then flipping it 90 degrees, another 90 degrees, and another 90 degrees before we come back to the original flip. Okay, so how can we flip images? How can we increase the number of our data set? This is what we will be doing at the moment. We are going to come here, add a new cell. And we are going to iterate over every image we have and flip it or create multiple versions of a flips of it. So I'm going to be looping over the images just as this for loop, the same, nothing new. I will be reading from the path as well. So also nothing new here. I'm going to be reading them as grayscale, nothing new here. Now, every image I read, I would like to flip it. So I'm going to be saying for are for rotation in the range of between 0 and 3. I would like to flip it three times. Okay, plus the original, we would be having four photos, four images for every image. Now we will say image is equal to cv2 dot rotate image done, then cv2 dot rotate underscore 90 underscore clockwise. And now we will be writing all of those images. Let us write the image cv2.imageWrite. We will be writing it in the same path. And we are going to add a keyword that this is modified or rotated. Then we would like to give it the label name. So here we will be having strk. Convert the name or the label here to string and stri the which image number is this these are optional you can name it whatever you want the important is every image should have a unique name plus dot png and then which image we would like to save which is image okay so all of this is just the path and the name of the image this is the path and this is the name okay now Take a look at this folder before we run this. We have 100 entries for circles, 
squares, we have 100, and triangles. Let's run the script. Oh, I just noticed before we run it, we just need to add i here, because we forgot the i, and then enumerate. Okay, of course we've talked about enumeration in the first section of this course. Okay, now if I try to run this, now as you can see here, we're getting an error that we are not having a numpy array because we need to convert this to numpy array first when we are reading it. So here it will be np.array. All right, we also have a comma here. Let's replace it with a plus. That was a typo. Now, if we run all the cells from the beginning till here, and we're done executing. Let's take a look at that folder. We will see now that we have 200 images. And take a look at the pattern. The same circle is being rotated. One, two, three. This one as well. Three rotations. One, two, three. Okay. So that's really good. We were able to rotate all the images and create duplicates of rotated versions. Same thing for squares and same thing for triangles okay let's see the performance now i'm going to be copying this and pasting it here because we have added the new images okay now we have this let us execute execute the following cell now this cell and let's train the model let's see if the accuracy will improve or not and again, we stopped at 41. That means that we did not get this much of an improvement. As you can see, maybe the validation is a little bit better than before, but it's still not good enough. Well, what are we doing wrong? What could we do more in order to get good results? I am really going with you step by step to all the problems that you're going to face when you are training on your own data. I mean, we could have used some data from some data set and just follow certain steps that they recommend, and then we would be getting good results, but real life is not like that. We will always struggle a little bit until getting our model to predict correctly. What I would like to introduce right now is something called dropout. Let's take a look. So, so far we are having issues in getting the model to work. Well, let us add some dropout into our model. Dropout is going to be deactivating some of the neurons in every iteration. Okay, so usually we count on the neurons being deactivated according to the activation function. If it's zero, it won't fire. But with dropout, we can force some of the neurons to be zero to improve the model while training by magnitude of times. So let's see how we can do that. If I go to the import and here near the dance, I add something called dropout. Let's add a few dropouts. So I'm going to be adding here. So model.add dropout. And the value can be between 0 and 1. 1 meaning I will be turning off the whole layer. And it makes no sense. So let's turn off half of the neurons here. Maybe let's add one here. Let's turn off 40% of them. And here, at, after the 16, maybe we can turn off only 10% of them. Okay, now let us run all of those one more time. Okay, now we have generated more images than we want. Let me fix this. So I just recreated the folder with 100 images. Let's do it again. Okay, now we have 200 images again. And now here we are flattening everything. And here we are splitting and let's start it training. As we can see, the accuracy is actually increasing this time. See, the accuracy is 0 0.9 and the validation accuracy is also not bad itself. See the zero here, and here's the continuation, 6.4, 6.1, 60, and we stopped at 0 0.6. Well, that is not bad. Now let's plot what's going on. Here we are plotting the loss, and the validation loss is increasing. Okay, let's plot the accuracy. 
as you can see the accuracy is actually increasing okay let's plot everything together well we can see that there is a problem with the validation it is increasing a lot okay let's see if we run it again will we get anything different now we tried to run this with 500 epoches and as we can see we got better results now as we can see here the validation is not really doing well so maybe we are overfitting a little bit right now because as we can see accuracy is too high and validation accuracy just stopped improving it means that our model started memorizing the data okay now let's try to even increase the number of samples further so we will see how powerful is data augmentation so let us run this now we will be having 200 images right here let us generate more data so let's compile this one more time now we have 400 images let's see if we will performing and having better results let's flatten great let's split and let's train now 64 55 72 70 so as you can see the validation accuracy is actually increasing now we are reaching 80 so with more data we can get way way better results that's really great now we are at 84 i think this model is going to be the one that will be predicting good data that's really good as long as we are in the 85 percent that means we have some really good model it can do some stuff 85 86 and we are still going let's see where will this take us and we are done and we got about 85 percent validation accuracy let's plot this as we can see the validation loss is fluctuating a lot but that's totally okay let's remove it from here and just observe the others as you can see the validation accuracy is increasing and the accuracy itself is increasing and the loss is decreasing this is what we are looking for when we are evaluating any model for classification we want these two lines which are related to validation to be coming from the bottom all the way up and the loss need to be coming from up all the way down that's great now next we will be plotting the confusion matrix to see where is the model making the most mistakes okay now let us see what is the scores that we have to get the maximum accuracy okay we can take the accuracy maybe from the x test and from the x test data set that we have let's create a variable called predict and then we will be predicting our x test so model.predict then we have x test if we try to print this we will be getting multiple entries each entry containing the probability of every class now how do i know what does everyone corresponds to well we need to go back to our encoding one more time what we have done here is converting every label to an encoding right so let's try to print this encoding and its corresponding value so here we'll be printing y and let's print data label so the first entry is circles and we can see that the second entry is actually the squares because the ones are on the second entry that leaves us that number three is actually the triangle okay this is how we got it now let's continue working now that we have what does each label mean let me print this predict one more time what i want to do right now is extract who is the maximum here i was predicting x test okay and x test contains multiple entries first entry this is the result and it contains here 99 percent and it's saying here that 99 percent this entry is actually a square let's take the second one the highest one is here 
the third entry so it's saying that it is almost 100 percent that this one is a triangle so i want the function to extract who is the maximum here and assign it to the correct label okay let's try to do that we will be creating a new list empty one called y prediction and we are going to iterate over all the entries for i in range between zero and len x test and now we will be using a numpy function that will extract the index of the highest number okay so let's take this entry who is the highest index it's here so this function will return the index here which is index one let me call this by indexes instead of by numbers who is index one it's a square so here it means index one is actually a square let's try and code this index is going to equal to mp dot arc max and then we just need to pass the entry this one will return the index of the highest number for every entry now what i'm going to say is if index is equal to zero i would like to say print dot append who is the zero it's circle so just append circle now let me copy this if it's one who is one it's a square so i'm going to be typing here a square and finally when index is two this should be triangle and that's it now how about we create a similar one but for our y true okay so this is my y prediction and this is my y ground truth which will be an empty list okay so let's create the same loop but for y true okay here it's going to be y test and here it's going to be y test and here the array is y true that i want to append to it's like extracting this encoding from the y test and just assign it a label you might ask why didn't i just use the y that we have regularly because we have split our data and we are not sure how is this being split this is why what i'm doing is i'm predicting using the model for the x test set for all the test images and then we are getting the result we are assigning them a label and then we are doing the same thing for the y test which are the labels i want to understand what are the grounded truth labels that we have okay this is why we are creating two loops one of them is for the prediction to get the correct label for the prediction and the other is to get the correct label for the y true okay now let's create a very simple data frame i'm gonna call it score data frame so or just score bd dot data frame columns is equal to y true and y print okay now those are the columns now let's assign them so we have score y true is equal to y true and score y print is equal to y print compiling no issues at all now let's evaluate this using two matrices one of them is the accuracy score and then the confusion matrix because accuracy score can be just done so fast just let's import and all we need to do is just print accuracy score y print y true this is dot and as you can see we have an accuracy of 0 0.85 which is not really bad and we got it by evaluating only the test set that's good now let's do the confusion matrix we are ready to do that let's copy this and just add instead of accuracy score from the matrix we would like to get the confusion matrix so con for confusion matrix is going to equal to confusion matrix again just y print 
and y true how can we plot this we need to import seaborn import c born as sns and sns dot heat map pass it our confusion matrix then a not is equal to true for annotations then we have c bar equals false let's add an x label predicted and y label true values let's run it another typo and here we go this is my confusion matrix let's copy the indications here so that we know what is zero what is one and what is two zero means a circle one means a square and two means a triangle and we can see that when we have a two here meaning when we have a triangle it was predicted three times as a circle and when we have five times of a triangle we have predicted it as square five times but otherwise if you take a look at the diagonal we have predicted this correctly 67 times 69 times 67 times for every label if we compare the x and the y that means our model is really performing okay for the data set that we have next we are going to be predicting singular data one by one let's see how we can do that now that we have seen the confusion matrix let us predict single images let's say that you brought some images from somewhere else and you would like to predict them i used paint to paint those small pictures so i painted this circle as you can see here this is a 28 by 28 pixels then i have this square or square like that also i would like to predict and i have this triangle let's see if my model is going to be able to predict these correctly or not these are not from the data set we have these are actually drawn by me so let's take a look first i'm going to be having the path here because i need the path to read the image and i'm just going to be pasting it here okay you can do the same as well and you can download these three images from the attachments of this lecture what's important is before passing this image to your model to predict you need to pre-process it the same way you pre-processed all of those images what did we do here we read the image we converted it to an numpy array we did an inversion on the colors we replaced all the values over zero with one we flattened it we did a flatten so we need to do everything that we have done before otherwise we will not be getting the correct result or we will be having some errors when we are trying to predict i'm going to be copying all of those and just paste them here okay let's take a look at the size so image dot shape we see that it is 784 which is correct now we can predict so i'm going to say predict or pred single for single image model dot predict and then i'm going to be passing image now we still need to do one more reshaping so i'm going to be saying image dot reshape one by seven eight four sorry and we're good this is actually important for the model because if you remember if we take a look at the input of our model where was it here the shape is actually a double okay and this corresponds to this one 784 okay now let's print the prediction so i'm gonna say print single and as you can see the highest probability is index 2 and index 2 is actually a triangle and this is what we are reading predict t is actually my triangle so that's correct now let's try predict square my image is called predict s so i'm passing a square right now let's see and the highest probability is index one meaning a square so this is also correct great now let's pass a circle highest probability is here actually and yes the first index is a circle let's encode this actually pretty quickly i'm gonna be just copying this
and instead here I'm gonna just say print and what is my index let's copy that as well and here I'm trying to get the index of the maximum from the predict single okay now if I run this it's a circle that's correct let's predict s uh, we still did not delete the append okay let's try again with this is c for circle s for square and t for triangle so we have completed the whole circle we have learned how we can pre-process our images how we can flatten our images so that they can be suitable for an artificial neural network how we can tune it in order to get higher accuracy how we can augment images to also get higher accuracy how to plot the accuracy for validation and for loss we saw how we can see the confusion matrix how we can take the exact scoring or the exact accuracy from accuracy score and we also learned how we can predict single images so this is the whole circle for ann and by that we have concluded this project one more thing that i would like to mention is how can we save a model right now we are training this whole model in order to get this model variable and then we are using it to predict new data but it does not really make sense that I would train this just to get the variable here for model in order to predict new data. What we can do is we can save this model as a separate file. I mean, everything that we have trained here, just save it in a separate file and then load it again whenever we want to predict new data. And the way to do that is very simple. Let's say here after confusion, let's say we evaluated the model, the model is ready, and I just would like to save it. All I need to say is just model dot save and just say what is the name of it let's say this is shape classifier and you need to give it an extension of h5 okay to me i would like to add this whole path to it okay so i know where exactly i am saving it if i compile this this will be saved now let's say that my model is empty now I don't have a variable called model at all. If I try this, it will say, hey, you are trying to predict with a model and there, I don't have a variable called model. Because here the variable that's called model is the one that I have trained. But right now I cleared it and when I try to predict, I don't have a model. So what we need to do is do this import, which is load model. And we will say here model is equal to load underscore model and just give it the path here let's run it and we're good now we are independent of everything that we have done right here all we need to do is just when we are done training and done evaluating just save it and you can load it again from its directory and continue working so your prediction on a new data would be the small code you can turn all of this into a function into a class you can turn it to whatever you want and then you can have a model that is ready to predict new values we have talked about building machine learning models and how can we predict data sets that we have and we have actually built some really cool applications now let's say that you have a client and you would like to build this client a certain machine learning app and you would like him to use it how would you do that luckily there is a very handy cool library which is called streamlit streamlit is used by a lot of companies out there large companies like tesla like ibm and this wonderful library helps you get build a wonderful looking machine learning web apps where you can easily deploy them and add them to your website so I'm really excited to start this section with you guys. Let's build some machine learning web apps. Of course, the first step in order to start with Streamlit, the wonderful library to build machine learning web apps, we need to install it. So how can we install Streamlit? We just say pip install streamlit. 
hit enter and let it download. Once it's done, we open our editor, be it Jupyter Notebook, be it Spider, and just say import stream lit. And here we go. We have successfully installed stream lit. Hello guys and welcome back. Right now we are going to start implementing some machine learning web apps. But before we do that, let us first get introduced into Streamlit. Streamlit will help us build web apps really easily. So we can add widgets, titles, images, videos, and just convert them into a web page simply without any knowledge in HTML, CSS, programming languages, or even without the complications of libraries like Django and Flask. Of course, Flask and Django are for much larger scale web apps, but here if you are looking to create a couple pages program for a client or for just for fun, then this is the target library for you because it will help you build your app and prototype it really, really fast. And it's really beautiful. I mean, the widgets are really, really nice. So let's get started. First, we will be importing stream lit. The simplest thing to build here is maybe a title. So let's build the title and see how we can run the app because the way we run it is actually externally using Anaconda prompt. So if we just simply say st.title and then just say this is my first program. Okay, let's say here as st and we're good. Now we are not going to be running this program from Spider. So we are going to save it. Copy the path, open Anaconda prompt, go to that path by typing cd, which means change directory, pasting the path. And here we go. Now what we are going to do is say stream lit run and the name of the file, which is streamlit.py. Make sure that you watch out for the capitalization of your file name and click on enter. Now open Anaconda and just change the directory to wherever your file is. Type cd to change the directory and just paste the path that you have copied from Spider. And here we go. Now let us run the app. The way to do that is just by simply saying stream lit then run then the name of your file in my case it's called string lit.py if you did not save this file yet just save it in the directory navigate to it and just say stream lit run stream lit.py make sure that the capitalization of your file name is correct and hit on enter now a local host is going to open now a local host is opened and there is the title we have. This is actually a web page that can be deployed into the internet. If you did not find the web page or it did not open automatically, all you need to do is just copy this HTTP column double slash localhost and the port is 8502. Then you should be getting this page, meaning that everything is running as expected. Now let's learn about some really cool widgets. Now let's learn about widgets. What are widgets actually? It is those control panels that you see on any website. It could be on any website or any software. It's those sliders that move right and left. It's those buttons. It's those checkboxes, list boxes. We have actually mentioned all of those when we were talking about GUI design. And the same way we have those in libraries like by simple GUI, we have those as well in Streamlit. Let's see how we can do that. Let's create a slider bar. So I'm going to say st.slider, and that's it. All I need to do now is to give it a name. Let's call it my slider, and then we can specify some aspects. Let me call those by their name. So I'm going to say here label is equal to, and if you take a look at this list that is displayed, this is all the parameters that we can pass. 
I'm going to be passing minimum value. Let's say it's zero. You don't have to pass these, but passing them is nice to specify what is the minimum and the maximum value of your slider. Let's say that my maximum value is actually 100. And we can pass a default value as well. So let's say value. Let's go to a new line. Value is equal to maybe 50 in the middle. Okay. Let's test this out. We save it. We go back to our script. Now we need to exit this in order to open the page again. Click on Control and C, and you'll see that we are exiting our local server. Now press the up arrow in order to get back to whatever entries you had. As you can see, you can press the up and the down arrows in order to get history of all the commands you have run. Now, if we hit on enter on the same command, it will open again. And this is a slider. You'll see that this is my slider and we can change the value between zero and 100. Okay, let's see what other widgets do we have. Maybe one of the most important widgets is buttons actually. So let's say st button and then just give it a name. Let's say submit, save it, go back to your anaconda prompt, control C to exit and stop the server. Upper arrow to go back to your same command line, to your same command here, press enter, and it will open an, a page next to it. Now this is my old page, it was updated, you can close it, and this is a new page. Now we can change this, we can press on submit, nothing will happen because we did not bind it into any actions yet. So far so good. How about we add some select box where we can choose multiple options? That would be great. So we're going to say st dot select box and then we will be passing what is the titles or the label let's say this is my box and then the options the options need to be passed as a tuple like this two parentheses let's say the options are i don't know burgers juice and pizza okay just for testing, let's save it. Go back to the command line, control C to exit, upper arrow, and hit on enter. We will see that if no page has opened, it will say page not found because we exit. Now we are opening again, and here we go. This is my box, burgers, juice, pizza. This is really, really easy, right? We can even go further with those. This is really, really cool. How about we go a step further and divide our page? So far, everything is just in the middle. What usually happens in those web apps is that we would have a sidebar containing all of our control and the action that is happening would happen here in the middle. So how can we actually leave this title here and maybe move all of those into a sidebar? This cannot be easier. Take a look. If I just leave the title like that, it will stay in the middle. Now, if I add the keyword sidebar to all of those, so I'm going to say st.sidebar.slider, and I apply this to every widget I have, I save, I exit, control C, upper arrow, and execute. Now, this is my program. As you can see, it is now divided into two sections. One of them is the control panel, and here is the action of my program. That's really cool. Right now we have some really nice looking web page without actually doing anything yet. Without barely writing any code yet. So this is the beauty of Python libraries. They hide all the infrastructure for you so that you can prototype easily and create some really cool products. So far we have created widgets, but they are totally useless if we cannot read the value that the user is blocking in. Let's say this slider. How would I know what is the value right now? If I hit on submit, how would I read the submit action? And when I choose something from my box, let's say I choose burgers, how would I see that I have chose burgers? Let's see how we can read actions. 
Now, the simplest action to read is the actually the button, because the button actually returns a zero or a one. So what we need to do here is define a variable that is called button, let's say, for example, and here just we will say if button equals equals one, or for short, you can just say if button, and then let us print some new message. I'm going to move this title. I'm going to copy it. Let's create a title whenever we press the button. Let's say here, you have pressed a button. Let's save this. Do the same actions. Control C, upper button, run. Now, if I hit on submit, you'll see that I got a message on my action window. This is how we read a button. Now, let's continue. How about the sidebar? How would I read the sidebar? Let's create a variable here called sidebar. And then we are going to print this. So I'm going to say st title. And I'm going to be printing the variable assigned to sidebar. As simple as that. Now, if I save and run, if I hit on submit, you'll see that I got burgers. If I put pizza and I submit, I will get pizzas. Now, how about my slider here? Let's create a variable. Let's call it slide. Don't call it slider. Otherwise, it might not work because this is a keyword for streamlit. So here we're going to say st.title slide. So now we are printing a title equaling to that slider whenever we press submit. As usual, control C, rerun. If I hit on submit, you'll see that I got the result. Submit again, we are taking all of those results. All right, so right now we are going to collect as much features as possible, then we will be implementing them in your, some really nice machine learning project. Let's assume that we have some features from a data set. Let's say here is my features. And those features are in a dictionary containing, let's say, color. Okay. And then we have something like size. And let's say we have also weight. Now, what is this? Let's say that the user is trying to predict a certain fruit if it is a good quality or not. Okay, let me correct this. Okay. And the user will input the color of that fruit, let's say apples, and let's say that, and let's say the range here is between 0 and 10. And this would be rating how red it is. Okay. 0 being, let's say, yellow or too pale, and 10 being totally red. All right. And let's say he need to input the size. So let's say the sizes of apples are between, I don't know, 1 and 4. Let's start this with 1. Maybe it would be better. And let's say that the weight start at, I don't know, maybe 20 grams all the way up to 200 grams. Okay. Per apple. So those are my features. And I would like now to create a slider for each of them. All right. How can we do that? I'm going to leave those, submit and slide bar, and we need to work with this right now. What I would do is I would simply create a for loop, right? So I'm going to say for label in features dot keys. So I'm going to be extracting all the keys right now from the features one by one. And I'm going to be creating a slider, but there is no variable. I'm just going to create a slider. Okay. And the label will be my label. Let's change this to key, actually. And here, the label will be just the key of my dictionary. Okay. By the way, I'm going to remove this. We don't need it anymore, at least right here. Now, we have the label is my key. The minimum value is nothing but my features key and the first value, which is the minimum, right? If I access features... If I access the key, I am iterating, let's say color, and I access the first element, which is this, this will return my minimum, right? Now, the maximum value is nothing but, let me add a new line here. It is this one with key number one, right? And by that, we are accessing the second element. 
and finally to the value what should be the value how let's say that the value the default value is always in the middle how can we do that well it's very simple we will take the average of the minimum and the maximum how can we do that well let's calculate the average for every key we are iterating in i'm going to say average is equal to i'm going to open a parenthesis and it's going to be the minimum plus the maximum and all of this will be divided by 2 and i would like always this value to be an integer okay i don't want any floats for the average here and then i'm going to be passing average to the value okay and by that we have created multiple slide bars let's take a look at them if i save control c to exit rerun now if you take a look you'll see that i have multiple sliders i have the color i have the size and i have the weight that's really really cool now the preceding question is how can i get the value of those if i don't have a variable you know it's really not practical to create a variable right here create multiple variables for every slider and just print it out like that now the question is how can we access this slider values well we need to call a special method for that it is kind of a callback which we will use and we would need to assign a key for every new element we are creating so let's see how we can do that now we can access those elements by key the same as in PySimple GUI. So let's add a key in order to access these elements without variables. So I'm going to say here key is equal to key. All right. So the key for every slider is the key itself. Makes sense, right? Okay. Now, how do we access those keys? Let's say that I would like to add a title for every slide bar so if i hit on submit i want to print all the value and this will demonstrate that i have obtained those values so i'm going to create a for loop here when we press the submit button for key in features dot keys like that and there is a method that we need to call here and this method is called session state so we're going to say st dot session underscore state all right and then we would be passing the key to it we open a bracket like this and we just say key now we need to put all of this inside the title so st title and like this all right now let's save and go executing now if i hit on submit you'll see that i have obtained all of my values five two and 110 if i change these values i have now 4351 and this is how we dynamically read those values because it's important to learn how you can read those values anytime you want without having to actually assign them to variables because those widgets sometimes need to be assigned dynamically the same way we have done right now and the reason is when you are working with data sets you really don't know what you are going to face in this data set and you would like to generalize maybe your application as much as possible to adapt to any data set or at least to data sets that are from the same categories we have learned so far some really cool features how about we learn how we can plot in streamlit Plotting can be very cool when we see it on our machine learning app, right? When we are plotting the data or the result, this interactivity will make it really appealing to your customers. Let's say that when I press the submit button, what I would do is I would show the graph or the plotting of these features. How about we integrate Seaborn into that? How can we integrate Seaborn? Well, let us first import Seaborn as SNS and I would like to also import pandas because in order to plot in Seaborn we need to convert this feature into a panda data frame. So let's get started. Let's create it here. I'm going to be saying panda features 
is equal to pd dot data frame features right we cast it into a data frame type we cast our dictionary into that next we are going to plot we are going to create a variable for this plotting i'm going to call it pl is equal to sns dot pair plot i'm going to be using the pair plot the cool one that plots all the data against each other and i'm going to be passing pd features now what happens is we are creating an sns object stored in this pl what we are going to do is we are going to call a function that is called pyplot, which is a method by Streamlit, and we will pass it that SNS object, which is PL. And this should be it. Now let me save and let me run. So I'm going to press Ctrl C to stop the server, upper arrow, run one more time. Now let's say that we blocked our data. Now, once we want to see the result, click Submit. We are still loading. And here we go. As you can see now, we got our plots in the main page. That is really cool. We can use any SNS method. We can use any Seaborn method. We can even use Matplotlib method. Just you need to create an object of that plotting and then pass it to Streamlit and it will render it on your web page. Let us talk about one more feature. How about we divide our page into sections? So far we have the left side bar and we have that white area. How about we divide that white area into multiple columns so that we will display those titles, the results on the left and we will display our plot on the right while keeping the side bar in its place. To do that, we need to define how many columns do we want to create. So let's say we have column 1 and column 2. And we will be calling a function or a method in the streamlet that is called columns. Now we will specify the sizes. So I would like the first column to be around 30% of the second column. Okay. Here we define the sizing, how we would like the sizing to be. I would like the title to be small and I would like the plots to be large, the area of it. Now, all we need to do is we need to put the elements that are in column one together and the elements in column two together. How would we do that? This is very, very simple. Let's put the title here and the results in one column. So I'm going to say with column one and just put everything under this with column one and we're done. Next, we will say with column 2 and put everything in column 2 together. And that's it. We put the plot in one section and we put the results and the action message here in another section. Now, let's save it. Let's run it. Here we go. Now, let's hit on submit. It's still running. And as you can see, now we have two sections. This is the first column and this is the second column. We can actually enlarge any plot we have by pressing this button as well. I mean, this interactivity is really, really easy to do, and it's really pretty. All right. And we are ready now to start our web app machine learning project. We are going to create a machine learning based project where we will be predicting where the user is going to choose a type of flower, give its parameters and see if this given flower type is correct or not. It's like I'm going to be guessing what is the type of this flower that I am going to plug its information in. Those information are the sepal dimensions and the petal dimensions. Now, this will teach us multiple skills, like how can we integrate a web app with machine learning. Let's say that I would like to predict a versicolor, okay? I'm saying here that my guess of these parameters that I'm going to plug in right now is versicolor. Now, if I hit on submit, it will say that the model predicted virginica, but you have a predicted versicolor. So they are not the same. So the parameter here is R for Virginica. Now let's say for the same parameter, the user said, okay, this is Virginica. And we hit on submit. We will be getting a congratulation 
message with balloons and we will be plotting our prediction and the distribution of all the categories. Now, this is not really a complicated project, but it will give you a lot of new skills in integrating those together. So let's get started. So let's start implementing the project. We will be starting with a few libraries. We have Streamlit to create the web app. We have Pandas to pre-process the tables. We have PCA because we will be taking our data and reduce its dimensionality so that we can pass it to k-mean clustering and there we will be clustering the data. So it's a really good practice using these two machine learning algorithms. We will be using matplotlib to display the plots and NumPy. First, let's create those sliders. The first thing I want to do is to actually prepare the sliders. Remember that the slider widgets have a minimum value and a maximum value. So let's get our data set first and create those widgets. So let's get our data set first, then extract the parameters for the minimum and the maximum value to pass it to the sliders. So first, here's my data is equal to sns.load. We need to upload import sns as well. So import seaborn as sns. Then here we will have sns.load data set and we have the iris data set next after loading our data set we will be creating the boundaries dictionary where we will be keeping the minimum and the maximum values now what i would like to do is to get the labels remember we are trying to predict the species so if i say print data dot head like that you'll see that i have printed them now take a look at the species I would like to get what are the names in the species. I don't want to get the whole column, I just want the unique name. Because those are the names that the user will choose in the user interface, as we have seen when we were talking about the overview of the project. Okay, so how would we do that? Let's delete this and create a variable called labels. And then I'm going to be passing mp.unique. Now this will return only the unique values from my dataset species column, okay? Now if I am to come here and just print the label and correct this typo, of course, here we go. We will see that we got the keys, right? Those are the unique values. So those are the values I want them to be in my drop-down menu. And what I mean by that, these are the values that will be displayed in here. Now let's create the sliders. To create the sliders, I would like to get all the features names, meaning that I would like to get all of those except for the species. So let's create an x features equaling to data dot drop. Then I want to drop the species, right? Because I just don't want the predicting label to be here. And then we have x is equals one. This will be my x. Let's clean, it a let's clean it a little bit. So we'll say x is equal to x dot drop an A. Now we are cleaning the data set if there is any non-applicable values. And finally, we are going to get those keys. I'm going to create a variable called the prime keys. Okay. And this will be x dot keys like that. Now, if I am to print this prime keys, You'll see that I got all the features names right here, right? Now, why am I getting the features names? Because I'm going to get into every feature we have and get the minimum and the maximum value. Plus, having the features stored in such a variable could be useful when we are implementing the program. Because it's important to know what features we have to show them as options to the user. Now, let's extract the boundaries. So I'm going to say for key in prime keys. So we are going to iterate over all the features we have column by column. I'm going to say boundaries key. So whatever feature we are at in the for loop right now is equal to an empty list initially. Then I'm going to be saying here boundaries again key is equal to append we have feature x key and then we are going to call the method minimum okay here it's complaining that we did not create the boundaries dictionary yet so let's create it here 
I'm going to say boundaries is equal to an empty dictionary. Now, we are adding to every key we have an empty list. Okay, so it's like we're creating a dictionary with a key and the value of the data of it is just an empty list, which we will be populating. Now, let's populate it. I'm going to say boundaries key dot append. We are going to append a new value to that list, which is the minimum of that column. How would we do that? I'm going to say x key. Now we are going to call the method minimum like this. So here we will access this whole column of every feature and get the minimum value. Next, we will do the same thing now, but for the maximum value. Okay. Now let's print this boundaries to see what we are doing. And here we go. You'll see that we have a dictionary. Sepal length is the feature. This is the minimum value and this is the maximum value. We have sepal width, minimum, maximum. And we will continue like that until we reach petal width. Okay. Now we have the boundaries to use on those sliders so that the slider does not go out of this range. Right now, I'm not going to be creating any widgets. I'm just going to jump into the machine learning model. And then at the end, we will be creating the widgets. All right. So this is what we are going to do next. I have copied and pasted the same functionality we have used when we were talking about PCA and uh, K-mean clustering so that we don't have to rewrite them again. And I'm just going to quickly summarize what's going on. We have created a PCA model with two principal components. We are fitting the model and then simply we are doing a transformation. So right now we have a PCA transformation which we will be using when we are predicting. Next, we are adding those into our feature. We are adding the PCA columns into our features. Then we are calling k-means and we are deciding that we would like to have three clusters because actually we have three species. We are fitting the model and we are doing some predictions. Now, we are doing predictions here because I would like to draw those uh, predictions whenever we hit submit and we show the user his prediction location in between all the predictions. So all the predictions will be obtained from here. We have talked about this when we were talking about the machine learning module, specifically the k-mean clustering. All right, so right now our model is ready to be used. Right now, since we have created our model, it really does not make sense that whenever we run our app, we are fitting, meaning we are training our model one more time. I mean, training consumes time, and this will make our page really slow. Imagine that for every prediction, I would just retrain the whole data set I have in order to make one prediction. This makes no sense, actually. The solution for that is that at this stage of developing, we actually save that model as a separate file and then we would use it. Instead of training the model whenever we are doing a prediction, we will train it right now only once and then save this trained model. And every time we would like to use it, we would just load the model in order to make a prediction. This is way, way faster than training the model and then doing a prediction. We have talked about saving and loading. We have talked about saving and loading models before, and now we are going to apply it. We need a library that is called pickle. So I'm going to say import pickle. And now, after I am done with all of this, I'm going to be saving my models. I'm going to say here file name is equal to, I have already saved the directory that I would like to store it in. Okay, you need to change this directory actually and choose a directory of your own. And then you can keep this as it is, which is the model name. This is my iris model. Now let's actually save it. I'm going to say, I'm going to say pickle dot dump. Now we need to say the model name. So here we are talking about the iris model. We are not talking about PCA yet. We are just storing this k mini clustering model. So I'm going to say model. And then we need to specify the path. 
we will just say open, then file name, and then we will pass wb for writing. Okay, I think we have a parenthesis here that is not necessary. Okay, and by that we are saving the model. Now let's save the PCA model as well because whenever we want to predict a new feature, we need to pass it to PCA, then pass it to k-means. So here also we have a model for PCA which we need to save. I'm going to repeat those two steps. But here I'm just going to be calling it PCA iris model. Okay? And then we will do the same thing by dumping this model. Now if I execute this, now let's go to models folder. If we take a look here, we will see that now we have two models. Now we can load those whenever we would like to make a prediction. How can we do that? I'm going to be deleting this line here. Now model PCA is actually going to equal to this line. Instead of dump, we will use load. And let me take the file name as well. Okay, now we are done with, with those two lines. And we can remove this parameter. And we're good. Now model PCA is actually nothing but a loaded model. I can delete the fit as well. Now all we need to do is load this model and just transform PCA. All right, you might ask why are we still transforming PCA? The reason is, as I said, I would like to draw all the data from my data set right here. And to do that, at least I would need to do a transform. Still, we have saved a lot of time by just doing these two lines. All right. Next, I would do the same thing right now. I'm going to delete this line here. And I'm going to add pickle load. And I'm going to delete this line. Now we just need a new path, so this is the path that I have, right? It is the same one I used for saving. And now we can get rid of these two. So what happened now? We load a model, we do a transformation on the PCA, we load the K-mini clustering model, and then we do some predictions. Okay, on that PCA transform we have here. And this will improve our speed intensively. Let's start creating some widgets. The first one we are going to create is the select box. So we have here select box is equal to st.sidebar. We need everything to be on the sidebar. Then dot select box. And let's pass the parameters. I'm going to pass a message here saying what species do you think it will be all right next we will be passing labels or label and label is those species that we would like to select all right and by that we are done with the select box now let us create those sliders how can we create them we're going to say for i key in enumerate prime keys now what is a prime keys just to remind you prime keys was actually just the keys themselves but they are in a variable so those are the feature names we have like the tepal length sepal width etc okay now what are we going to do with them we're going to create a slider for each of them so i'm going to be saying here st dot sidebar because they will be also on the sidebar dot slider and then we will be passing the label. What is the label here? It is actually the key, whatever it is, the feature name we have. Then we have the minimum value. Now it's time to use the dictionary that we have used, which is boundaries key zero. This is the minimum value that we have stored. And then we have the maximum value. So this is max value being equal to boundaries key 1, right? Next, we need the default value. So value is going to equal to the average of the maximum and the minimum converted to an integer because we don't want any float values right here. So this is the minimum value. And we also need to add to it the maximum value. And then all of these will be divided by 
2. This is how we take the average. And that's it. And it is also converted to an integer. Finally, we are going to create a button. I'm going to say here submit or sub submit button is equal to st.sidebar. It's also on the sidebar, then button. And the label is called submit. There is one more thing that we have forgot here, which is adding a key. So key is going to be simply the key here in the prime keys. All right. And by that, we are done doing the interface. Now, before we dig into the functionality of the button, let us test what we have done so far out. At least, let's see if the widgets are working as expected or not. But before we do that, we have a very small mistake here, which is when we are trying to load a model, we are using WB. Instead, we should be using RB because we are reading a new model. We are not trying to write the model, right? So here we are reading the model with this parameter. Also here, when we are appending the minimum and maximum value, there is something we need to know that slider take only integer values. So when we are appending the min and max, we need to convert it to an integer first. So let me convert those to an integer and let's save. Let's also remove all of those prints where we were debugging. Okay, now let's save. And let's run the program. We'll go to our command line here. Streamlit run streamlit.py as usual. And hit run. Okay, it looks like we still have one more mistake. Okay, so right here we are also loading to the wrong model. So the file name here should be PCA. Because this is the PCA model. And this is my iris model. Okay, let's try it now. And here we go. As you can see, we got all of our options. We have Citosa, Versicolor, Virginica, and we have those sliders that are working in the, on the minimum and the maximum, as well as our submit button. That's great. Now let's do the functionality of this submit button, which will do all of this evaluation. Now, what we are going to do is, Whenever we press the submit button, we would like to start processing the data that the user has given on the web page, right? So I'm going to say if sub, what are we going to do? We need to collect the data. So I'm going to be creating a function right now. Just for that, I'm going to say define collect data from the user. We are going to pass keys to it. And here I am trying to collect the data actually from the sliders I have. From here, we have learned how we can obtain data from keys and we are going to apply that now. I'm going to create an empty data list. Okay. Now we are going to iterate all of those keys one by one. Remember that the keys we created for every slider is nothing but the feature name itself. So all I need to say here for key in keys. Iterate over all the keys and then just say value is equal to st.session underscore state. And then we need just to pass the key. Finally, we're going to say d.append value. And then we will be returning that dlist. Okay, by that we have collected all the values from those sliders, right? We are using session state. And to read a certain key, we are reading the key value, meaning the slider value, storing it here, and then adding it to this list, and then returning the whole list. Okay. Now, what is this data? Those data actually are the parameters I'm going to be using to do the prediction. Now, we are going to use the techniques we use for single prediction on our model, which we have learned about in the machine learning section. And we have applied on many problems. So, let's create a variable called to be predicted parameters is going to equal to collect what was the name collect data let's pass the primary keys meaning all the keys all of our feature names now we are going to just create a data frame and then do all the pre-processing needed on this data if you don't remember how we did this you can go back to 
where we were talking about how to create PCA, k-mean clustering, it is the same thing we have done before. So I'm going to go over it really quickly here. I'm going to create a data test. And it's going to equal to pd.data frame. And I'm creating columns is equal to to be predicted. So we are creating a data frame from this one entry the user has given us. Now we're going to say data test is equal to data test dot append. Now we are going to append here pd dot series. Then we have data test dot columns. Then index is equal to data test dot columns. Then we will be passing ignore underscore index equals to true. Okay, here we have prime keys. All right, so here we are replicating the same data frame we have read here so that we can pass it to PCA. Okay, next, now we were going to do the PCA transformation. So I'm going to say here test transform is equal to model PCA, which we have loaded dot transform data test. Now we're going to say data test. PCA1 is equal to test transform. Now we are extracting the PCA components. We need here the first PCA component, which is zero actually. And we need the second PCA component that we have transformed already. All right, and we are done from this. Now I'm going to be doing my prediction. So I'm going to say predict or prid is equal to model dot predict test transform and that's it we pressed submit we collected the data from the user we pre-processed it in order to pass it to pca we passed it to pca pca processed it and now we are passing it to k-mean clustering to be to do the real prediction okay now let's see what did the model generate to us i'm gonna say here st dot title and I'm going to be saying the model predicted. And we are going to see what did the model predict. I'm going to say if prediction zero, meaning if the prediction value is equal to zero, then I'm going to be printing st subheader setosa. Now, what is this? When we are predicting, we will be re returning a value of zero, one, or two. And since the order of 0, 1, 2 is Setosa and Versicolor and Virginica, if we return 0, it means that the model has a predict Setosa. And I would like to print that. Next, I'm going to be doing the same thing now. Elif, it equals 1, then this is Versicolor. So we have Versicolor. And finally, if this equals to 2, it means that this is Virginica. Then I would like to say here, st.title, you have a predicted, right? We have said what did the model predict, and then we will say what did the user choose. And I'm just going to be saying st.subheader is going to be my select box option. Okay? Remember the select box, the user chose something, and I'm saying here that you have predicted or you have chosen the select box. A uh, box here is a small letter. Okay. Now, before we continue, how about we test this out? We have a couple of syntax issues that you might face. Here, session state is actually a dictionary that you need to pass that you need to access and not a function. So we need to put this in brackets instead of parentheses. And here we have an issue that I don't know where did this come from. We need to say just model equals blah, blah, blah. Okay, now we are good to go. Let's test this program out. I'm going to save and run the program. Now we are refreshing. Here we go. And now if we hit on submit, You'll see that the model predicted Setosa and you have a predicted Setosa. That's really great. 
Now we are going to create a message here saying that congratulations, you have guessed correctly. Otherwise, we will say that the guess was wrong. But let's try to pass something else. Let's say Versicolor. We'll see that the model predicted Setosa, but you have predicted Versicolor. Now let's try to change the parameters and try again. Again, it's Setosa. Let's try this out. Again, Setosa. Let's try this out. Now it is Versicolor. And you have predicted Versicolor. Let's try Virginica here. You'll see that the model predicted Versicolor and you have predicted Virginica. Okay, so far so good. Now let's add that message that says, Congratulations, you guessed right. I'm going to be creating an if condition here saying that if select box is equal to label prediction zero then i would like to say st dot sub header congratulations your guess is correct now here we need double equal sign now what is this what is label let's go back to check what was label label was actually the species we have Right? So we have Virginica, Versicolor, etc. All right? And here what we are saying is since this prediction is returning 0, 1, 2, and those 0, 1, 2 correspond to the species in the same order, I'm saying go to label. If the prediction is 1, access me label 0. If the prediction here returns 0, then Access label 0, which is the first element in the species column, right? So, to recap, prediction returns 0, 1, 2. I'm using this 0, 1, 2 to access the species, the three species we have, right? Since the mapping is the same. This is why I'm saying if what the user selected is equal to that, then that's great. Now, I'm going to also recall st.balloons, which is a cool function that will throw balloons all over the place if the condition is satisfied. Now, else, I'm going to be saying st.warning. I would like to give a warning message in yellow that the guess is wrong. So I'm going to say here, sorry, your guess is not correct. And a sad face. Okay, now let's plot the figures we have. All right, and that's it. Now let's try this out. Save it, close, reopen, submit. You'll see that your guess is not correct. Let's choose now, let's choose now Versicolor, submit. Congratulations, your guess is correct, and we got the balloons. That's really cool. We have created something new now. Lastly, I would like to plot the figures right here, showing where the prediction located inside the clusters. Let's do the last step of this project, which is plotting the clusters we have created using our dataset and also plotting the prediction and its location in between those clusters. This will create some really nice output to our program. So, we are going to be using matplotlib. We have learned how we can create a plot using Seaborn, but right now I also want to show you how we can create matplotlib. Uh, plots as well. It's a little bit different. So first we need to say figure is equal to, of course it needs to be in the if statement. So here I'm going to be saying figure is equal to plt dot figure. Okay. And we need to create an axis. So we will say ax equal to figure dot add dot subplot. We need to pass one 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 here. We have talked about those when we were talking about matplotlib. This is fig for figure. And now we are going to be using scatter. So I'm going to say plt.scatter. This is exactly the same as when we were plotting PCA transformation. Now, what are we going to plot first? Those. I want to plot the PCA transformation for my iris dataset, the whole dataset. I'm going to be saying here PCA underscore transform. And then here we have the first PCA axis. 
Then we have the same thing but for the second PCI axis, so those are my X's and Y points. Next I would like to pass colors. Now colors is going to equal to Y predict. Remember this Y prediction we have, which returns 0, 1, and 2. Now 0, 1, and 2 are going to be encoded as colors, so every group will have its own color. And then the size here is going to be equal to, let's say, 40, the size of every data circle. Now let's plot our prediction. So I'm going to say here the same thing. I'm going to be copying this, pasting it here. And instead of PCA transformation, what do I want to use? I would like to use my test transform, right? Because we have transformed our single data point using PCA and stored this transformation in test transform. Now let's replace the variable name simply here. Let's give it a different color. Let's say that our prediction will have the color orange and the size so that we can see it clearly, maybe uh, 150. This is the size of our prediction circle. And the last step is just to say st.write figure. Okay, this is it. This is how we create figures using matplotlib. All right, now let's save this. Let's see if we have any errors around here. Control C to exit the server, start the server again, and here we go. Now let's say that I have predicted versicolor. I'm guessing it is versicolor. Let's see what the model is going to predict. And congratulations. But we have a problem in the figure right here. If we take a look here, we said add dot subplot, it should be add underscore subplot. That's okay, let's save again. Control C to exit, restart the server. Server is restarting as we can see. It's all grayed out, meaning it is restarting. It restarted, click on submit. And here we go. It says model predicted versicolor. You have a predicted versicolor. Congratulations. Your guess is correct. Those are my clusters and this is my location as a prediction. This is a really cool app. Now let's try something else. Now the model predicted Setosa, you have predicted Versicolor, so your guess is incorrect. And as you can see, the point is located right here where we are in a different cluster. Okay, so by that we have created some really cool app that we can deploy on the internet. And we have utilized multiple skills that we have learned in this course. And we have combined web pages actually with machine learning models. Now the possibilities here are really infinite. We can create any machine learning model and just display it on a web page and create apps as you wish and you can distribute it to your clients or even you can make it just for hobby or just for fun.